Yeah. yeah. She didn't know. She didn't know. She didn't know. At least, yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here early on a Saturday when there's so many options in Southern California to do outside or elsewhere. Um, this morning, we have a great group of uh, speakers um, to provide you, uh, our patients, their families, friends, uh, a little bit about melanoma that we thought would be of interest to you. So um, thank you for coming here today in person, the 150 plus people that may be online and others who have elected to see this later on. So um, the format is that we'll have each of the speakers. We're gonna to try to reserve the questions to the end unless there's something very uh, pressing. Um, so if everybody can kind of hold off there, we have cards, you can write up questions. And again, we're gonna to try to answer everybody's questions uh, if possible. So again, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, and again, we look forward to some lively discussion. Hopefully we can answer a lot of questions. So thank you. So Dr. Margolin's gonna come up first and she's gonna introduce our first speaker. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, my name is Sam Guild. I'm the president of um, AIM at Melanoma. We're the largest international melanoma organization and I'll share some of our resources later. Um, but before I go any further, I just quickly want to thank um, just a few people, of course, St. John's Cancer Institute, uh, Dr. Esner, uh, Dr. Margolin, who, by the way, who does her in plain English. Um, so thank you. I want to throw that out there. Um, Shaniqua, um, Aneda, um, Dave and Eleanor. Thank you so much, Anne and Eric. Uh, but I just want to go over a couple of things. So um, we are being live streaming this event and we are also um, recording it. So if you want to see it again, the presentations, not the Q&A, but the presentations will be available. Um, we are live streaming this internationally. I think 150 is an understatement as to who's watching this. Um, so if you're here in person, there are index cards inside your folder. You can use those to put your questions down and we I will and collect those during um, various points. Just raise your hand and wave me down. If you're joining via Facebook, Zoom, um, et cetera. In Zoom, there's a Q&A. You can put your questions there. We're collecting those and we will get those uh, to the panel. Um, if you're on one of the other social media channels, those are being monitored as well. So we encourage you to put those questions there. And that's it. I just wanna make sure that you guys um, um, you know, have all the information you need before we start. And again, thank you to the panel and all of you for joining us.
Thank you, Sam. That was very professional and uh, made us feel like this is a real event. It's also nice that uh, we were afraid there wouldn't be enough people in person here. I think it's a very nice number and it also allows for a nice amount of uh, social distancing so that we don't have to worry so much about our, our masks. Uh, I'm not gonna take any time right now. Uh, you'll be hearing from me later, um, but I would like to just move on to immediately introducing our first and keynote speaker, whose name is Dr. Shasha Hu, uh, who works at the University of Miami as a dermatologist. Um, I probably don't know all the specific titles of various chairs of this or that committee that she holds, but I do know she's a very talented uh, dermatologist who has has a very uh, nice uh, field of research that she's going to tell us about and make it uh, at a level that I think you guys are really going to enjoy and learn from. I would also just reiterate, if you have questions specifically about the presentations that will allow you to understand them better, uh, don't hesitate to ask them. And then we'll have much more of a general sort of a free for all later on. So there should be plenty of time for interactions. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's really truly an honor and a privilege. I'm going to go right ahead to my talk. Do I press here? Share screen. Share screen. Bottom left. Bottom left. This test. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Keep going. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, in the next 30 minutes, I'm hoping to uh, share some of the facts about melanoma that you may not know. I'm sure everyone here, including those people joining us virtually, have already know a lot about melanoma through either personal experience or family experience. Um, but today I'm hoping to kind of enlighten everyone with facts that there are important that may not be on your radar. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And we're here today because melanoma is truly um, a, a huge public health issue as it continues to be the top among the top 10 new cancer diagnoses for both men and women in the US. And while the survival rate of melanoma has improved a little bit uh, in the recent years, but we're still seeing a steady increase in melanoma incidence in the U.S. as well as worldwide. Uh, this is why we're here today to talk about solutions, address gaps in care. And I'm hoping to share with you knowledge and research that we have done at University of Miami that may change what you already know about for example, who gets melanoma? Who's at higher risk of dying from melanoma? And lastly, is skin biopsy the best way to diagnose melanoma? Okay, so first question, who gets melanoma? Obviously, we already know a lot about melanoma risk factors, such as family history, such as your skin type, your sun sensitivity, and your sunburn exposure, as well as uh, additional genetic factors such as DNA repair defects, certain genotype um, carriers. We also know that there are no genetic and modifiable environmental risk factors such as how many sunburns have you gotten in the past, how much cumulative sun exposure you have gotten in your lifetime where you live and whether you have had tanning bed use, whether you have had received uh, immunosuppression for, for example, transplant, uh, history of organ transplant. So those are known facts about uh, melanoma risk factors. So when we think about who gets melanoma, we typically think of a light-skinned Caucasian person, such as uh, celebrities we know, uh, well-known, um, John McCain, um, Olympic swimmer, uh, swimmer Summer Sanders, but we also know that there are um, celebrities like Bob Marley, who actually passed away in my home institution, Jackson Memorial Hospital. 
from acral and tentious melanoma. And more recently, former Miss Universe Stella Yara Torres uh, got diagnosed with stage three melanoma from a mole that she neglected checking and it changed over time. So really not just white person got melanoma, melanoma affects all skin colors. And I'm gonna share with you a story that is not so common in my practice. Um, and I'm hoping it's not something that you see daily here, but it's uh, it reflects a issue that we're seeing in the world of melanoma. So this patient came to me. She was in her um, mid forties. She was of Cuban descent, Hispanic woman. Came to me of uh, uh, year three, over three years of this. What she thought was a wart involving her fingertip. She initially saw care with her uh, family physician, uh, treated as a wart with a, a few sessions of freezing did not get better, she got frustrated, she did not see anyone for a while and it got worse. And then she eventually saw a dermatologist in the community who thought, oh, maybe something else other than work, but unfortunately the biopsy was not deep enough and, and did not really show much. And then, so that was put aside. So, well, it was a wound and she got some wound care. And uh, so not getting results from the medical system kind of um, led to uh, not seeing anyone for a period of time. What time she got to us was clearly a melanoma involving the digit. And of course, our biopsy confirmed that. And unfortunately, she did not do well. But so this is really a case illustrating delayed diagnosis, not being aware of who can get melanoma can potentially affect outcome. So really when we look at who gets melanoma, yes, there are stratifications of risk factors as well as how much risk you have. So for example, while light skin Caucasians are at the highest risk, Hispanics and Blacks also do get melanoma. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time about uh, talking about melanoma in Hispanics because this is where we're seeing a emergent public health issue. Um, so I'm gonna back up a little bit just to kind of explain to you. Hispanic is really a self-identified ethnicity category. Um, it really identifies people who originate from Spanish speaking countries. So a person of Hispanic ethnicity can be of any race or heritage from European, Native American to African. And we have a very diverse uh, subgroups of Hispanics in the US, those from Mexico, those from Cuba, those from Puerto Rico, et cetera. So really Hispanic uh, ethnicity encompasses a very heterogeneous group of uh, uh, populations with different skin color. They can be light skin color, they can have uh, freckling, they can have uh, sun, sun, sun sensitivity, or they can have a, a tanner skin, a brown skin. Um, so really, um, Hispanic population is very diverse, but we also know that Hispanic population is among the fastest growing population in the U.S. It has been projected one every four Americans will be Hispanic in by year 2050. Um, and interestingly, over 50% of Hispanics live in just three states, where I'm from, Florida, uh, here, where you are, and Texas. And so this is why our group had the advantage of uh, working closely with our state cancer registry and local hospitals to collect a lot of information to further examine melanoma in Hispanics. Uh, and we have found that Melanoma incidence rates, while it's low in Hispanic, has been increasing steadily, uh, particularly at an annual rate of 3.4% per year in Hispanic women. And that echoes to national data of 2.9% per year increase in Hispanics. And that is really comparable to 3% increase per year in non-Hispanic whites. Not only that, we have reported that Hispanics have delayed melanoma diagnosis and they have worse outcome. Uh, when we looked at Florida State Cancer Registry, it was found that a significantly higher proportion of melanomas diagnosed in Hispanics were at distance stage at time of diagnosis compared to non-Hispanics whites. And when people looked at uh, 
the National uh, Cancer Registry SEER surveillance uh, epidemiology and end results that collects information from major states in the US. And this group looked at over 30 years of data, again, found that there is a significant disparity in late stage melanoma diagnosis among skin of color uh, communities. And then additionally, even in the localized stage, skin of color patients are more likely to have ulcerated melanoma with uh, greater depth. And this is uh, an issue because we all know melanoma survival is intimately related to stage uh, diagnosis. And it has been confirmed when you look at this graph, um, whites definitely have uh, the best survival rate from melanoma uh, and skin of color patients have worse survival rate. Again, I just want to reiterate the poor outcome likely is due to later stage uh, diagnosis. This study using the same 30 year interval uh, data from CEA registry found additionally not having uh, as good of a survival rate, skin of color patients have not experienced improvement in melanoma survival in the past 20 years. And when you compare survival rates before 2000, 2009 uh, to those diagnosed after 2010. Interestingly, in patients with a uh, regional and distance stage, only Hispanic individuals have actually had worsening survival rate in melanoma specific survival rate. Um, uh, and this is really um, interesting to note and important to try to understand better because we know that, as I sh uh, show you very beginning of the talk, melanoma overall survival rate has improved um, due to the uh, introduction of immunotherapy and target therapy, but clearly non-white populations, including Hispanics, have not really benefited from the introduction of these more effective therapies. And in fact, studies have shown that skin of color patients are less likely to enroll in clinical trials and receive immunotherapy. Um, so our group wanted to delve a little bit further uh, to examine what factors may contribute to this uh, uh, differences or gap in melanoma outcome. Uh, obviously, the two biggest factors impact melanoma outcome are race, ethnicity, and social economic status, which is really how affluent, how affluent, how poor you are. Um, in the past, um, studies have been limited, not able to tease out the difference between race, ethnicity, and social economic status, because these are two intimately related uh, factors. So our group uh, did a study using area-based measure uh, to kind of really see if there are independent risk factors or they are dependent risk factors when it comes to melanoma outcome. So using an area-based uh, measure is a very neat uh, and also validated research tool. Basically, instead of getting your salary information, getting your tax returns from uh, every individual melanoma patients, we look at where the melanoma patients live. Um, the idea is that where you live influence or is a reflection of how well um, you do economically. So if you live in a poor, uh, low-income urban neighborhood, uh, it's very likely that you also have a lower income. And versus if you live in a more affluent neighborhood, it's more likely that you have more resources, financial resources. So in this study, we identify clusters of late stage melanoma in Florida. And within each clusters, we examined uh, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, insurance status, as well as poverty and social economic status based on where people live. And we found that poverty clearly was a independent risk factor. For every 1% decrease, when you have poverty below the poverty line, you have a 2% higher risk of getting late stage melanoma. Uh, male or, uh, have a little bit worse risk factor, but the strongest predictor for late stage melanoma was being a Hispanic person. And that's independent of uh, insurance status uh, as well as um, um, uh, gender. 
and, and, and poverty. So our study uh, validated this uh, concept that Hispanic ethnicity is an independent risk factor for late stage melanoma. And it outweighs uh, other factors we know already impact melanoma outcome. And so this is very uh, puzzling. Why? What's going on? Is it because they have different tumors? Or is it because we are seeing accumulative effects of barriers to health and also individual level issues such as awareness and knowledge. Uh, so we wanted to look a little bit deeper. Um, we looked at individual level knowledge, awareness, and behavior and attitude towards skin cancer, melanoma prevention in Hispanic population and uh, found, yes, Hispanics have less knowledge about skin cancer and this affects their behavior. And I think this is not just unique to Hispanic population. If we substitute Hispanics with Blacks or with uh, Asian Americans or with even um, uh, non-Hispanic whites, but a lower social economic status, you, this, I think this holds true. Knowledge correlates behavior. Uh, we found that Hispanic patients are much less likely to use sunscreen or uh, wear protective clothing. We we also surveyed high school students in Miami. Uh, we wanted to look at the youth because as we know that a majority of our sun exposure lifetime um, is, occurs when we're younger, uh, especially young adults. And we found that after controlling for their skin type, their family history, um, their sun sensitivity, um, Hispanic students compared to their non-Hispanic white peers, so these are groups controlled for the differences in skin color and sun sensitivity, are much more likely to have used tanning bed, a lot less likely to use sunscreen, uh, think of themselves as less likely to have skin cancer, and have uh, also a lot less uh, knowledge about uh, skin uh, checks um, and never have gotten um, being told how to check their skin. So that's important. There's definitely a gap that we need to fill uh, when it comes to educating a uh, Hispanic population. Uh, we also looked at secondary prevention, that is uh, getting skin ca uh, cancer screening, getting skin checks. It was found that Hispanic patients are a lot less likely to have had a full body skin check by the primary care physician compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, other than this has been confirmed with other study looking at Hispanics elsewhere in the country as well. Uh, and now, of course, in addition to what you know about skin cancer, in addition to your genetic uh, background, race, ethnicity, there's also system factors. So system factors are factors like uh, what kind of insurance you have, what kind of uh, plans you have, how do you access uh, healthcare, how much do you access, your, uh, how, how well do you know about navigating the healthcare system? So uh, typically when we look at healthcare system, there are either fee for service, or managed uh, care in the US. These are the two main types of healthcare delivery system. So our group have found that when we looked at Medicare patients, so those are patients older than 65, it's interesting that Hispanics enrolled in Medicare fee for service are more, much more likely to receive late stage melanoma diagnosis compared to Hispanics enrolled in HMO. And then within the fee-for-service system, Hispanic Medicare patients were also a lot more likely to, than uh, um, non-Hispanic whites to have late stage and also have less survival rate. So this, again, points out to um, an issue that's maybe inherent to, it, to how Hispanic patients navigate fee-for-service. So definitely needs further investigation. And then when we look at the finally, the last element, which is tertiary prevention, which which is at the step after you have received a diagnosis of melanoma, uh, what occurs after that diagnosis. Studies have found that the skin of color patients are much uh, more uh, likely to have a longer wait time to, uh, from diagnosis to definitive surgery. And Medicare and Medicaid patients also uh, have a, a slightly longer wait time. And then additionally, skin of color patients who are much less likely to receive immunotherapy or enroll in clinical trials. Um, so those, are, again, 
identifying gaps or uh, we could improve and close the gap, improve outcome for myeloma. So when it comes to who gets myeloma, I'm hoping that I have convinced you that everyone can get myeloma. But even though Hispanics and Blacks have lower risk, they're at higher risk for being diagnosed with more advanced disease. And this is why when we ask the question, who's at high risk of dying from myeloma, when we look at the global data, taking a whole Hispanics and other skin color communities have worse survival rate and have not benefited so much of the advances that we have seen lately in immunotherapy and target therapy. Um, but there is hope. I have presented gaps in our care. And so really, if we work together, um, we can potentially definitely improve and avoid cases that I'm seeing in the clinic, such as late stage acronychitis melanoma, melanoma that have metastasized at time of diagnosis. And just very briefly, um, as um, providers, um, we should really be aware of how to give uh, a culturally competent encounter. So taking the uh, account of patient's knowledge level, linguistic preference, what the culture background is, how much, how, what, how do they think about skin cancer? What's their attitude towards the diagnosis? We also need to have improved community outreach programs to really educate um, minority populations especially Hispanic population, as it no will not be minority in a few years. And then lastly, uh, we also need to improve awareness on providers on how to um, um, triage patients with a skin of a color background and also uh, look at the gaps where the system, healthcare delivery system is failing certain patient, patient population. Now, I'm going to move on to the last part of my talk that's changing gear. Uh, so I was stepping away from the public health aspects of melanoma. I'm going to share something that you may have not heard before. You may have, um, but is the uh, question is, is skin biopsy the best way to diagnose melanoma? Of course, skin biopsy continues to be the gold standard because it gives us histology, it gives us depth, it gives us uh, tumor uh, path, uh, histology in terms of ulceration, mitosis. However, there are some limitations of skin biopsy, especially sometimes we don't get the best sample. Sometimes um, patients may have lesions on very cosmetic sensitive areas that where you may want to think twice about risk of biopsy, something that's ended up to be benign. And also we have high risk melanoma patients who have hundreds of dispositive nevi. Do we really want to cut out all the nevi because we're suspicious? Uh, and additionally, biopsies leave scar, and a lot of times areas that, um, for example, if you look at my patient with dysphagia nevus, um, I'm going to move this panel slightly. If I'm going to hide this, I'm sorry. Um, uh, it, it's impossible to know what you're going to biopsy, what's going to give you the best yield. Uh, so in our institution, we use a variety of tools. We have dermoscopy, uh, where it's a kind of like a fancy magnifying lens that let us to see structures and uh, cells uh, and light reflection at deeper, uh, a greater depth. That helps uh, us to be more uh, accurate in terms of our categorization of a lesion. We also use short-term digital monitoring. So we look at a mole. If it looks uh, strange, what we call the ugly ducking sign or funny looking mole, we follow them instead of jumping right ahead into biopsy. This is a lesion on my patient's back. Uh, it looked weird. It had like some irregular globules. And we did a short-term monitoring in six weeks, in 12 weeks. As you can see, these little dots have changed over the course of two intervals of six week monitoring and with biopsy it was a evolving uh, melanoma. Um, that really helped us to justify the biopsy. Sometimes we'll use total body photography or mole mapping. This is a, I'm sorry about this, this is actually a screenshot of a uh, computer projection uh, of my patient with dysplastic nevus syndrome. So as you can see, comparing photos, um, taken a year apart. This is a brand new nevus or new lesion. 
even though it looked harmless on dermoscopy because it's brand new on an adult. Uh, so adults usually should not have new moles. Uh, we biopsy was a atypical spitz nevus, and that helped us to uh, diagnose and uh, catch it early, so to speak. Week. Um, but sometimes these are not enough. So I'm going to talk to you about something that we use um, in our clinic. Uh, it's called reflectance confocal microscopy, RCM. Have you guys heard of it? Uh, confocal microscopy for skin uh, uh, diagnosis. <laughs> I see my colleague, uh, who is also a seeker today, today have uh, seen about it. But it's not something so common. It's only in certain cancer institutions. So this is a non-invasive tool that allows us to visualize uh, cellular structures without taking a sample of the skin. Of course, there are some limitations, but really when you look at this technology, it gives us a, 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 a way, it's almost like ultrasound of the skin, but we're able to see cellular structures of the ref, because of the reflective property of especially melanocytes. Uh, so we definitely use this as a, uh, a adjunct tool when we evaluate high-risk melanoma patients. So this is the machine, what it looks like. When we have something suspicious, we use a ring that attached to the skin. Uh, it has a sticky on this underside. And this is all my research fellows. We uh, then kind of place the laser head uh, and they kind of attach to the ring and it allows us to scan this uh, lesion of interest at different level of, of depth. I'm gonna show you very quickly. How am I doing on time? Okay, <laughs> so, there's no clock here, so I wasn't sure. Okay, uh, it won't take too long, but I think this may be fun for everyone to see. For example, so this is like a, a illustration cartoon of what the top layers of the skin look like. Um, and so using confocal, if we scan at the very superficial level, which is called stratum spinous, spinulinosa, uh, so some, and you can see this is what the skin looks like under the uh, uh, RCM or confocal microscope. Uh, this is a very nice, what we call a normal uh, honeycomb pattern of um, a healthy or uh, uh, normal skin. Uh, you can see these are keratinocytes at the uh, spinous uh, layer. But if we scan a little bit deeper, where the epidermis meets the dermis, so this is important. And when we talk about melanoma, anything invades the DE junction with a dermal epidermal junction is really invasive. Uh, and melanoma, and that uh, also the deeper it goes and the higher the breast low depth. But at the DE junction, if we say take a on block, cross section of skin so you can catch the undulating hills and valleys of the de junction and this on um, confocal it gives us exactly that so the dark round oval areas represents the dermal papillae and they are circumscribed by these little rim of bright cells. These bright cells are typically your melanocytes at the basal layer or uh, melanin-containing keratinocytes reflecting kind of the basal hyperpigmentation. So this is what, what a healthy DE junction looks like, what uh, we call um, dermal, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. He healthy DE junction uh, is called edged papillae. So this is what good looks like. And we go a little bit deeper scanning at um, the superficial dermis area. So now we're below the epidermis. You can see, I mean, I don't think you need a medical degree to know this looks good. <laughs> this does not look good. So these are sort of the ugly, atypical, very heterogeneous, bad melanoma cells on confocal. As you can see, the confocal really gives a great detail of what cells look like, uh, their configuration, and um, how large the cells are, how uniform they are, uh, without the need to biopsy. Uh, so I'm gonna show, uh, do a couple cases, just kind of illustrate the role of confocal microscopy in a, a clinical setting that may be more inter of interest to melanoma patients. This is a patient I took care of a few years ago, actually like six or eight years ago. He came to me, he's from Honduras, obviously, even though he's Hispanic, but he's light-skinned Hispanic. He noticed this growing dark, uh, what he called like a sunspot over like a few years. And he was seen 
by a few dermatologists. No one really wants to take a big chunk of uh, skin off the, someone's nose. So he had a few biopsies were not conclusive. So they're sunspot, uh, not sunspot, like what we call like lichen planus, like keratosis, but he just did not feel right because it kept changing, kept growing. Um, so when we looked at uh, uh, using just the typical dermatoscope, which is like a handheld magnifying lens, fancy handheld magnifying, as you can see, there's a scar from prior biopsy. But you can see here some irregular sized follicular openings right next to scar. So that is kind of suspicious, but did not really scream out melanoma. This is what another photo taking with the confocal, the macroscopic head of the confocal. So we took a scanning of the, what we thought looked most asymmetrical area on the lesion. As you can see, um, I will zoom in these areas a little bit later. This is not the spinous layers. You can see these are areas we have sheets of dendritic cells. They're kind of elongated, uh, uh, kind of uh, wavy, bright cells. And <clears throat> When we zoom in a little bit uh, more into these little sheets where area have the sheets of dendritic cells. So these are the bright lines, squiggly lines. But you also have what we call patch toy cells, which is not something we should see in healthy skin. Um, and 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 when we looked a little bit deeper at the non uh, at the D junction, this is not a typical oval round with ring, ringed uh, edges. This is called non edge papillae. And we also found dermal nests of a typical cell around the sebaceous gland. Uh, so this is something for more for clinicians. So that means we should not be treating with a topical uh, chemotherapy because it went down the sebaceous gland. So this. Um, bio, um, confocal the diagnosis was melanoma and a biopsy confirmed by using the confocal guiding us where the worst area looked like. So this gentleman had a full resection with skin graft. This is him five years later. You can see the scar has healed very nicely, barely noticeable, and he's, I'm, I'm still seeing him, he's doing great. But this is a case where confocal really helped us to narrow down the diagnosis. The second case is also interesting. This is a, uh, a male with history melanoma, skin cancer, new facial lesion. It looked like nothing. It's like one millimeter. Are we gonna biopsy this? On dermoscopy, it shows some gray dots. It could be pigmented BCC, it could be LPLK, um, but would you biopsy a big chunk of someone's face when you're not sure? So this is what bring the confocal in. We get, on confocal, you see there are some bright cells with atypical uh, pattern. Again, when we look at the DE junction, this is very atypical non-edge papillae. You can already see the atypical cells here. And I'm just going to show you, we can follow areas. I'm going to go through like almost like a picture. You can follow the enlargement, the atypical cells going through the uh, spinous, going down to the DE junction. So on, on confocal, it really looks like melanoma. So that we, we decide to biopsy it, and then it turned out to be a melanoma in situ. Last case, this lady was referred by her rheumatologist for a suspicious mole on her right calf. She has no family history of melanoma or skin cancer, really very minimal risk factor. It looked a little bit suspicious. On dermoscopy, it looked very vascular uh, like a lesion, like a blood vessel uh, lesion, but with some atypical scar like areas. So it's not clear 100%. Uh, when we use confocal, you can see first scanning the structure kind of matches what it looks like clinically on dermoscopy. And when we looked at the dark areas, it turns out to be blood vessel. And so using Confoc, we're able to get additional reassurance that these are just lacunas of like a dilated blood vessel. So this is a capillary hemangioma. We don't even need to biopsy. When you say, this is not worrisome, no, uh, leave it alone. But we also did a full body skin check. So this is a, where we call the incidental finding where patients comes with something suspicious, we'll call the index lesion, but often skin cancer is the incidental finding. And we found this on her thigh. On dermoscopy, it's a little bit suspicious, but not screaming melanoma. You have granules, you have dots, you have uh, some um, <clears throat> reticular network. And uh, so it's like, mm, should we cut it out? Should we monitor it? Um, so on conf we did a confocal, and you can see on confocal, this does not look good. You don't have the typical honeycomb pattern. You have dendritic cells. 
you can have these, these large patch toy cells. Um, and if we keep going, this is again showing uh, <clears throat> areas you have large atypical cells. And again, you, you, get, you get the idea. So at D junction, we even saw nucleated cells with atypia. Uh, and so these are not supposed to be on normal benign lesions. Again, uh, just uh, multiple areas of bad looking stuff. <laughs> uh, and so dermoscopy diagnosis, we had dysplastic nevus or melanoma, confocal diagnosis, melanoma, and it turns out to be a early superficial spreading point to find melanoma. So in summary, I have shown confocal actually is a very useful tool. Skin biopsy is the ultimate gold standard, but we have non-invasive tools to help us to better manage triage suspicious uh, lesions, especially in patients with high-risk melanoma, also the dysplastic nevus syndrome. Of course, this is a limited technology. It's expensive, requires uh, specialized training, and it's not for everyone. But <clears throat> to answer the question, is skin biopsy the best way? Mm, it's still gold standard, but we can do better. And there's definitely evolving technologies that we we'll may share with you at a different conference about non-invasive diagnosis of melanoma. So this concludes my talk. I hope I have uh, brought some new information to everyone. Again, thank you so much for having me. Stop sharing. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Um I know for the uh, audience, this raises a lot of questions, certainly from a patient standpoint of how we take care of you, how do we make the diagnosis, some of the technology that has been shown is, is evolving. Uh, there are other, thing, other uh, methods that are being worked on, including like, I know myself, we say, what about the apps that are available for the patients? But anyway, we could talk about that later uh, as we move along. So if there's any pressing questions, we can have them now, otherwise we'll wait to the end and we'll move ahead so we can stay on time. So our next speaker is uh, Miles Pickus, who is one of the genetic counselors in the Providence system. And his task today is to talk a little about genetics and what we know about it and how we can help our patients with melanoma. So thanks, Miles. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> All right, sweet. All right. Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, my name is Miles Pikus. I'm a board certified and licensed genetic counselor. And today I will be talking with you guys about genetic counseling and testing for melanoma. Um, so first of all, can I get a quick show of hands? How many of y'all have heard of a genetic counselor? <laughs> okay. All right. Better than I expected. That's good. It's a brand new field. So uh, for those of you that don't know, um, really what our role is, is to provide a genetic risk assessment for our patients based on their family history of cancer and maybe some genetic test results. So is there a gen hereditary genetic mutation that might be inherited in a family? And based on those genetic risk assessments, we can make certain screening and management recommendations for our patients whether that is screening for preventative cancer care or preventative surgery or targeted therapies as well. So with that, um, today I plan on talking a little bit about what is genetic testing, introduce you guys to the world of cancer genetics. What are we looking for when we're um, doing genetic testing and what are the different types of results that we can get? Who should get genetic testing? So what are the personal and family history clinical indicators for who should get a referral for a genetic counseling and testing, the usefulness, so what is the cl clinical utility of genetic testing and what it can do for our patients and their families, and lastly, a couple resources on how to get referred. So to start off with kind of a bird's eye view, um, we have about 20,000 genes in the body and they all perform different kinds of functions. Um, there are about 100 or so genes at this point that we know of that are responsible for protecting the body from getting cancer. So some of you may have heard of BRCA1 and BRCA2 or BRCA1 and BRCA2. And I'm just going to check real quick, okay. make sure you're sharing. I 
think you did it right. For some reason, it wasn't showing up. Mm. All right. So yeah, BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, these are actually called tumor suppressor genes. So their job is to suppress tumors from happening in the body. Um, some, some people call them the guardian angels of our body in that they protect the body from getting cancer. We all have these genes, and there are about a hundred of other genes that are responsible for performing similar functions. So for all of these genes, we have two copies represented by those two blue bars on the left. And the reason why is for every gene, we get one copy from our mom and one copy from our dad. Genes are made up of DNA, which is that double helix structure. And then DNA is really this code of chemical letters, A, T, G, and C, ordered a specific way. Um, so analogous to how a computer code is made up of ones and zeros, the code for, for life form in general is made up of these four letters, um, which stand for four chemical bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So what we're looking for really are misspellings in the genetic code or mutations or what we call pathogenic variants in these genes. So you can see that A in red there was substituted for what was supposed to be a T. And that is one form of a mutation called a single base substitution. Mutations come in all different forms. Sometimes a couple of letters get inserted or a couple of letters get deleted. Essentially, the idea is that when you have a normal gene, its job is to make protein, and that protein does the job the gene instructs the body to do. When you have a mutation in that gene, then um, it can disrupt the function of the gene. It doesn't make the protein. And so when we're thinking about a gene that is supposed to protect the body from getting cancer, from getting melanoma, and there's a mutation in that gene, that's where that increased risk for melanoma or other types of cancers can come from, or that genetic predisposition. So genetic testing is typically done with either a blood or saliva sample. There is DNA in both of these samples. And what we do is we send off these samples to a clinically certified genetic testing lab, and they unwind the DNA of all the genes there that we ordered for them to look at. And then basically they're spelling out every single gene, doing full gene sequencing, and they're looking for these mutations in, in, in these genes. A couple of weeks later, we get a report back and based on that report, we can make specific screening and management recommendations. So if we get a positive result, we'll, we'll know exactly what mutation and what gene that mutation is in. And then based on that, um, a lot of these genetic mutations have more than one cancer association. So what are the different cancers associated with that genetic mutation? What are the specific lifetime risks? And then based on those lifetime risks, what do we recommend for screening? for Im you know, imaging, how frequent, preventative surgeries, targeted therapies, things like that. So when we're thinking about hereditary cancer specific to melanoma, um, first of all, most melanoma is sporadic, meaning environmental, not genetic, kind of random, um, without a significant or prior family history of melanoma. Only about 10 to 15% of all melanomas occur in the presence of a significant family history. And only in about half of these do we find a hereditary genetic mutation. Um, and meaning a mutation in one of these genes on the right there. And there are some other preliminary evidence genes as well. And then there is that familial portion, which are, you know, melanomas that occur in the presence of a strong family history of melanoma, but we can't find a hereditary, like one single hereditary genetic mutation associated with that yet. And that's either because we haven't discovered the gene for it yet, or there are, or there's maybe a culmination of shared environmental and polygenic risk um, that is causing a you know, familial pattern of melanoma. So if we look into these genes on the right a little bit, um, focusing mostly on CDKN2A on the top right and CDK4, these are two genes where mutations in them are associated with this genetic syndrome called familial atypical melanoma mole syndrome. And that genetic syndrome is associated with increased risk for melanoma, about a 50% lifetime risk, and increased risk for pancreatic cancer, about a 15 to 20% lifetime risk for pancreatic cancer. Um, BAP1 is associated with melanoma of the skin as well as of the eye, so uveal melanoma, as well as increased risk for mesothelioma, which is a tumor of the lining of the lungs and other internal organs, and increased risk for renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer. BRCA2 is associated with increased risk for breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, 
cancer and melanoma, about a 5% lifetime risk for melanoma with BRCA2 mutations. And, and the list goes on, but really the point is that a lot of these genetic mutations have more than just melanoma risk. And so we can talk a little bit about, you know, what the significance of that is in just a bit. But really when someone comes into clinic and they have a personal or family history of melanoma, we wanna make sure these nine genes are on the panel and maybe a couple more as well. So who should get genetic testing? Um, we're not yet at the point where we're offering universal genetic testing. Um, as as we, I just discussed, you know, most melanoma is sporadic or not genetic in nature. So not everyone with melanoma should come rushing into genetics clinic. Um, so according to the American Academy of Dermatology and the NCCN, um, these following guidelines are uh, relevant for who should get a referral to genetic counseling and testing. So anyone with the presence of three or more invasive cutaneous melanomas, especially if one was diagnosed under the age of 45, you know, with hereditary cancers, the, the age of onset tends to be younger. The anyone with three or more blood relatives on one side of the family who have had melanoma or pancreatic cancer, anyone with more than 50 melanocytic nevi or atypical moles in a family history of melanoma, anyone with two or more Spitz nevus or now called BAP1 inactivated melanocytic tumors, or anyone with one of these tumors and a personal or family history of mesothelioma, meningioma, or uveal melanoma. And outside of melanoma too, anyone with these following indications should get genetic testing according to NCCN guidelines as well. So anyone with a personal or family history of pancreatic, ovarian, high risk or um, metastatic prostate cancer, male breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, anyone with a personal or family history of a first or second degree relative with breast, colon, endometrial, renal, gastric, or prostate cancer under the age of 50. And the list goes on. Um, give you a couple seconds to kind of just look through that. And then, and then of note to anyone with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry with a personal or family history of breast, prostate, pancreatic, or ovarian cancer as well. So what is the usefulness of genetic testing? Um, so one, it can provide an explanation for someone's personal history of cancer. If we find that someone who's had melanoma also has a genetic mutation in a gene associated with melanoma, then more than likely it is that mutation that's what drove their cancer risk. So it does provide an answer for some people. Um, genetic testing can guide decisions about management and screening. So if someone has a genetic mutation in a gene associated with melanoma risk, then we want to make sure that they're getting frequent dermatological screening with total body skin exams, maybe every three to six months. Um, and then of course, you know, as we've discussed with a lot of these genetic mutations, there, are, there is more than just melanoma risk. So we wanna screen for other cancer risks as well. So for CDK and 2A, for example, there is that increased pancreatic cancer risk. So we wanna make sure these patients are getting high risk pancreatic screening starting at 50 with you know, endoscopic ultrasounds and pancreatic MRIs every year. With BAP1, there is renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer risk as well. So we wanna make sure that you know, our patients know that they should be getting th uh, kidney ultrasounds every two to three years. Um, here at Providence, we are also offering a liquid biopsy early cancer detection test for everyone with a high risk genetic mutation. And that is a blood test that can look for 50 different types of cancers based on methylation patterns in the blood, um, brand new to the cancer space. Um, and then genetic testing can also provide personalized treatment and targeted therapies as well. Genetic testing can provide relief. If someone tests negative in the presence of a familial genetic mutation, then they're free from that genetic risk. It can provide less uncertainty um, for someone, you know, who is worried about their risk. You know, they have a strong family history. A genetic test result can be black and white for them. And then, of course, you know, genetics is a family affair. So when we know the genetic status of an individual or their family members, then we can help family members you know, test who might be at risk and then get otherwise healthy, unaffected individuals the right screening that they need for preventative cancer care. There are some limitations of genetic testing. Um, not all mutations can be found. The human, human genome was mapped about 20 years ago, so there's still a lot of genes to be discovered and a lot of mutations in those genes to work out and sort through as well. Sometimes we get these results that have some uncertain meaning. So these are called uh, VUSs or variants of uncertain significance. 
And basically what these are, are um, the lab finds a misspelling or a change in the genetic code, but they don't have enough data or evidence on that change yet to say, is this a benign, harmless change that's part of normal human genetic variation, or is this actually pathogenic, harmful, increases cancer risk? Most of the time, these VUSs are benign, but sometimes there is still some work in, in the gray area. And genetic test results, most importantly, indicate probability. Most of the time, it's a range of lifetime risk as opposed to certainty of developing cancer. Not all genetic tests are created equal. So with uh, Black Friday and Christmas coming up, a lot of people will be rushing to get Ancestry.com and 23andMe tests for their family members. Um, by all means, you know, it is fun. It, it can give us a lot of information about our ancestry. But if we're thinking about getting one of these genetic tests for clinical purposes, don't. Um, these direct-to-consumer ancestry tests use SNP technology, which is single nucleotide polymorphism technology, which means they only look at specific mutations within a gene and not full gene sequencing where they spell out all the letters of a gene. So 23andMe um, has a hereditary cancer test, for example, but they only look at specific mutations within BRCA1 and 2. It does not include the thousands of other mutations in those genes that someone may carry. Um, there are many other genes outside of BRCA1 and 2 that are associated with melanoma and other cancer risks that we want to make sure that are on our patients' panels. So there is the concern of false reassurance with a negative genetic test result through one of these tests. And the FDA does recommend confirmatory testing through clinical lab if, if you do get a positive result in one of these tests. So instead, we should look to clinical grade genetic tests from CLIA certified genetic testing labs that do comprehensive full gene sequencing. So they can look for all sorts of mutations from those single base substitutions to deletions, duplications, inversions, what have you. Um, for those of you that are thinking about genetic testing, but maybe worried about the ethical and legal implications, this, this may be um, useful information. So there is a federal law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA for short, which is a law that prevents employers and health insurers from discriminating anyone based on their genetic status. So using a positive genetic test result as a pre-existing condition, for example. However, this law has some loopholes in that it doesn't apply for life insurance, long-term care, and disability insurance. So when I have patients come in that want to get genetic testing, I do ask them if they have these insurances set up, because if they don't and they apply for it later on, if they get a positive genetic test result, that can, you know, have, have the life insurance companies raise their premiums on them or deny them altogether. So it's good to, good to know beforehand. And lastly, um, how to get referred. Uh, if, 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 if this is interest of you, um, please give our Providence Regional Genetics uh, referral coordinators a call at this number or give us an email for uh, slide specific questions. My email is down there on the bottom left. And we do have clinic availability. We have genetic counselors at Providence St. John's and uh, at the Margie Pre Peterson Breast Center, Providence St. Joseph's in Burbank. And we send genetic counselors out to Providence Holy Cross in Mission Hills, Providence Little Company of Marion Torrance, and a whole team down in Providence, Orange County as well. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Certainly, this is an evolving science. And, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have much in the way of genetics and melanoma. And again, it continues to evolve. And obviously, the question is, what is the impact on me? And what is the impact on, say, my family and my kids? Anyway, so we'll move ahead for sake of time. So uh, Shannon is here. There she is. So the next speaker, we're kind of going in a little bit of uh, order that is not exactly in sequence of what you might think. But anyway, we're going to move ahead. Just it was the sake of timing of our speakers. Uh, Shannon LaCava is uh, a psychologist. She works with the Cancer Support Community of Los Angeles, which many of you have heard about. And really, she's an expert in trying to help patients manage their lives through cancer. So thank you again, Shannon, for being here. Good morning and uh, good afternoon for some of you online. And yes, I'm Dr. Shannon Lankava. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm at the Cancer Support Community in Los Angeles, which is right around the corner from St. John's. And uh, I want to thank St. John's Cancer Institute as well as AIM at Melanoma for the opportunity to be here today. Let's see. Here we go. 
So I'm here to talk about whole person care. So this is if there is a diagnosis and their medical care is in place, how can we support the, the social and emotional needs of a person and their family? So this is what we look like. We've changed a little. Uh, we're very virtual right now with just uh, starting to get back in person. This is our community. And uh, to give an idea, I'm going to talk about different pillars of support that we have in place with special focus on our support groups and our individual counseling, as well as some other other areas. But to give some idea here in terms of support groups for somebody that might have a cancer diagnosis, as well as their caregivers and families, there's positive effects from being a uh, part of a group, that there's a reduction in distress, anxiety, depression, there is a normalization of an experience, there's a socialization of being with others that are in similar experiences, especially if someone might not be talking about what's going on or symptoms they might not understand, it gives a space for them to be able to be open with others. Um, our groups that we talk about here, there's three stressors that are very associated with all cancers, and that's unwanted aloneness, loss of control, and loss of hope. And that is something that also can be addressed with that co continued component of being with others. So uh, in terms of research, we talked a little bit about the quantitative piece, but really wanted to talk about that qualitative component here. And this is testimonials from people that have used our services and really looking at meeting other people in a support group who understand what we are dealing with, being a place to have that open dialogue and being among others that have those same challenges, as well as feeling grounded and, and gaining hope. Uh, brief counseling, so individual counseling. At our location, we offer brief, like eight week sessions uh, series, and that's at no cost for cancer support community. Right now, we have a little bit of a hold because there's a lot of need for psychosocial services for, or for counseling, but we have a long list that we can refer out to. But the idea of, of being one on one with somebody is just to give a space to talk about the needs with, with a diagnosis. And this can be for somebody that has a melanoma diagnosis. If there's a metastasis, we also have other support services, and I'll go into that. Okay. So these are various groups. So if somebody were to come in with a melanoma diagnosis or be a caregiver to somebody living with melanoma, I would say that we have groups that are for those that are living with cancer. I've highlighted them here. We also have other diagnosis-specific support groups and population-specific support groups. So if there's somebody who is between the age of 18 and 40, there can be a young adult group that might be a good space to talk about what it's like to be entering into a career when there's a cancer diagnosis. Uh, there's other um, LGBT TQ plus groups that we have, as well as diagnosis specific in case there's a metastasis and you might feel like that's a good fit. Some more. And I do want to highlight here that we have a collaborative group with Providence St. John's, and that's a patient and caregiver group. This is a group that's available for a person living with ca cancer, their caregiver, they can come as a dyad, come on your own. And this was actually in person at the hospital, and then it went remote, and we've had great success with being virtual. So hopefully one day we'll get back in person, but there is a space virtually. Okay, I'm going to go here. So uh, again, we talked about that family component. So we also really include a family. When there is a diagnosis, it happens to everybody, especially when considering that component of social and emotional care. So we've implemented family fun nights. So there can be a social aspect. It might not be like, let's talk about your cancer, but it can be, let's just get together as a family and be with other families. So our child, teen and family programs are open for individuals where a parent or a grandparent or a loved one has a diagnosis and there's children in the family, as well as when there's a pediatric diagnosis. So we have groups for parents, kids, and teens, and we also have educational events and support services. So something I wanted to, to highlight here is my lifeline. And uh, if any of you have utilized Caring Bridge or other support uh, platforms that are online. It's similar to that. My, my lifeline is cancer specific. So it is a space that you can create your own kind of like social network online. So you invite who you want to see. If you want to send a message out, you can determine who you want to send that out to. So the only people that access this are those that you determine that are in your kind of social circle of family within my lifeline. But there's also discussion boards where you can get information at any hour. There's ways that you can post comments and there's information and in, in, uh, melanoma specific components of care on my lifeline. And you can easily access your, the website app. 
Another component, and you'll be talking about clinical trials, uh, it was shared earlier today and you'll be hearing more. This is somewhat like a clinical trial, but instead of like a tumor registry, this is a registry that captures your social and emotional experiences of being somebody that is either having a diagnosis of cancer or melanoma or a family member. And uh, it takes about 35 minutes to complete, but this in the same way of those clinical trials that might get information on the actual type of tumor or the type of cancer, this gives us ideas to be supportive to those that might have transportation issues, issues with side effects, issues with other different distressors that come with a diagnosis of cancer. So I invite you if this is of interest, and this is a way of giving back. I have one more graphic here that just shows, and there's a lot on this page, so excuse me, but it really just shows uh, how you can, uh, when you feel ready, if you're interested to put this into a registry, put this information out there and also see how others like you are might be um, endorsing different questions on here. And the data also comes back to us at our affiliate level. So we can provide services that are best suited for the needs of those that are living in our area. Okay, so again, these are the pillars of support that we offer at Cancer Support Community here in Los Angeles. We are a national, actually international organization. So if you are online and not living in the LA area, you can go to Cancer Support. Uh, community.org to find a location near you and a lot of virtual services are available currently. We highlighted here just more, more so the group support and the individual counseling, but there's healthy lifestyle classes like Qigong or meditation or Tai Chi or yoga. And we also have a lot of educational programming and social events, but, uh, and again, a child, teen and family. And each thing that we talked about today is at no cost. So this is my contact information. You can reach out. I believe I have some cards here too. I'm going to sneak out um, after this. I think we have a break, but I'd be happy to talk with any of you. And I uh, encourage you to reach out if you have any questions for you or your family. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you so much. I, I don't know if there's any questions because Shannon has to leave early or soon. So I don't know if there's any questions for her that you can answer right now. Um, we do appreciate her being here today. So I think we're up for a break. So I think the break's till uh, uh, 10, 15. So everybody can take a walk, restroom, get another coffee, and then we'll just reconvene at 10, 15. So again, thanks everybody for their attention.
All right, we're gonna uh, get started. If everybody can uh, take their seats. So um, one point was uh, raised to me about the questions. So if everybody can kind of hold off on their questions and write them out so that when we get to the question and answer session, everybody can get the questions and answers so we don't have to duplicate efforts. All right, so we're gonna move ahead. Uh, our next speaker is Ashley Salazar, who's uh, a registered uh, dietitian at uh, St. John's Providence. And so she's gonna talk a little bit about diet and how do we deal with that in our cancer diagnosis and going forward. So thank you for being here, Ashley. Thank you for having me and thank you for those who have um, attended both in person and virtually. So today we'll talk about nutrition and melanoma and basically what the current research uh, says with the link between the two. Again, my name is Ashley. I work at uh, Providence uh, St. John's as an inpatient and outpatient dietitian. So just to start out with some statistics, uh, melanoma is the most common of all cancer types. Um, however, it is the rarest type of skin cancer, only accounting for 1% of um, skin cancers. Even so, it's the most fatal and uh, dangerous because it causes the, the majority of skin cancer deaths. One of the most prominent risk factors for melanoma is uh, sun exposure and UV ray exposure. Um, and so it would go to say that sun wearing sunscreen and wearing protective clothing is the first resort for preventing your risk for melanoma. Um, but research has shown that diet shows promising, um, promising uh, plays a role in, in also preventing melanoma. So just as a rule of thumb, maintaining a healthy weight at any age is one of the most important um, uh, things for general cancer prevention. Um, a study actually showed that obese men and um, obese and overweight men actually carry a 31% uh, increased risk for developing mel melanoma. Um, interestingly, a study by Theodorus and colleagues predicted a linear increase in BMI and melanoma, which is shown in the blue dash line, um, meaning that they predicted that if one's BMI increased, then your risk for melanoma would also increase. Um, however, it wasn't the case as shown in the, the red dash line. Uh, there, there's a data set actually showed that both overweight and obese um, men actually carried a relative, similar relative risk factor for developing melanoma. So whether your BMI was 25 to 30 or 30 and above, your risk for melanoma was um, essentially the same. Interestingly, also, they uh, found no association between overweight and obese women and melanoma, but there might be a confounding factor in the sense that um, both overweight and obese men, uh, women also have less sun exposure, um, because another data set showed that uh, the, the, the overweight and obese women who were actually um, uh, adjusted for sun exposure did show a positive and, um, and uh, significant, statistically significant increase for melanoma risk. So it would go to say that maintaining a healthy weight is one of the most first resorts for, for preventing melanoma. In terms of diets, a uh, plant-based diet has been shown uh, to decrease your risk for developing a lot of cancers, including uh, prostate, lung, mouth, throat, stomach, and colon. For other types of cancers, including melanoma, uh, research is either inconsistent or limited. Um, but it is a well-known fact that majority of Americans do not consume enough fruits and vegetables. Um, actually, a study by the American Cancer Society stated that only 14.8 and 19.1 um, percent of females, males and females, um, uh, only consumed the recommended amount of 2.5 cups of fruits and vegetables daily. Apart from antioxidants, plant-based diets also provide adequate fiber, right? And so another study um, found that individuals who were um, undergoing immunotherapy and diagnosed with melanoma 
they found that those consuming a high fiber diet actually had um, more survival, um, survival rates, higher survival rates versus the individuals with melanoma undergoing immunotherapy with low fiber diets. So you may be asking yourself, what is so special about antioxidants, right? Um, in order to understand why they're special, we have to understand what they do in the body. And so I like to call antioxidants basically the peacemakers of the body. So uh, free radicals and reactive oxygen species come in through either environmental factors or intracellular factors. And antioxidants basically, um, uh, basically uh, stabilize them, right, to prevent them from DNA damage that can cause other diseases. Today, we'll discuss a few antioxidants, including vitamin D, vitamin A, selenium, isothiocyanates, green tea, polyphenols, curcumin found in turmeric, and uh, polyunsaturated fats, and their association with melanoma. So vitamin D is the best researched. Um, there has been shown that low vitamin D serum levels uh, increases one's risk for uh, developing melanoma and also has shown that it leads to worse survivorship outcomes. Interestingly, another study found that uh, vitamin D, adequate vitamin D levels um, also improves the efficacy of treatment for melanoma, including uh, radiation and chemotherapy. So vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. Um, its active form is produced in the liver and kidney. And uh, we can either get vitamin D from food sources or from sunlight. Vitamin D source, food sources include things like fatty fish, like uh, mackerel, herring, salmon, egg yolks, liver, and fortified products such as vitamin D fortified milk, dairy, right? Um, cereals or orange juice. However, diet alone can usually only provide 10 to 20% of your adequate vitamin D that's recommended daily. So most of it comes from um, sun, sun absorption, 80 to 90% of it comes from sun absorption. Its main function is to regulate calcium and uh, phosphate homeostasis, but studies have actually shown that um, we also, cells also have vitamin D receptors or VDRs uh, that play a role in inducing cell cycle arrest, stimulating program uh, cell death like apoptosis and inhibiting angiogenesis and metastasis. So research is complex with vitamin D um, and inconclusive because of the fact that your main source of vitamin D um, is also uh, the main risk factor for developing skin cancer, right? Um, and so if an individual is unable to get adequate vitamin D through diet alone, I do generally we do recommend vitamin D supplementation, especially if you are deficient um, and wearing always wearing protective um, skin measures, whether it's sunscreen or protective clothing, when you are exposed to sun. So the next one is vitamin A. Vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin and it can be consumed in two forms. So there is retinol found in mostly animal products like uh, beef, liver, eggs, um, and certain uh, dairy products. And then there are carotenoids, right? Which are uh, found in alpha and beta carotene. You can think of your orange fruits and vegetables apart from other ones. So sweet potatoes, carrots, um, pumpkin, and then also spinach, broccoli, honeydew, melon, etc. So it plays vitamin A plays a well-known role in immune and vision regulation, but studies have also shown that it may also decrease the amounts of UV um, light that reaches underlying skin levels by increasing epidermal thickness. So it shows a protective measure against skin cancer. A study actually showed a 20% reduced risk for developing melanoma with supplementation of uh, retinol. Um, it found a null effect for vitamin A and, um, and beta carotene, but interestingly, beta carotene only has one twelfth 
percent of vitamin A activity of um, retinol. So it could just be that the study did not supplement enough beta carotene to show um, a protective measure against melanoma. The next one is selenium. Selenium is a trace element, and so we need it in smaller amounts. Um, but sources include seafood, meat, poultry, eggs, dairy, beans, Brazil nuts. Interestingly, Brazil nuts, two to three Brazil nuts a day has 100% of all your selenium needs, right? So that's an easy fix. Um, so selenium, the reason it's so special is because it acts as a cofactor for certain antioxidant enzymes in your body. So these two are glutathione peroxidase and thioredux thioreduxin reduxase. Uh, they basically uh, change toxic products like hydrogen peroxide and lipid peroxide, peroxide uh, peroxides, sorry, in your body um, to harmful water, okay? So studies are limited regarding selenium supplementation and melanoma specifically, but for cancer mortality, a study by um, Raymond and uh, colleagues found that they basically supplemented individuals with melanoma, um, sorry, with cancer, um, with 300, 200, and 100 micrograms of selenium per day. The, the individuals who were supplemented with 300 um, actually showed an increased risk for all-cause mortality and cancer mortality. And then those with 100 and 200 actually showed decreased risk for uh, all cause and cancer mortality. So there is a limit to supplementation as well. Um, we never wanna go overboard, right? Another study actually found that it also decreased your risk for developing melanoma specifically, but it didn't decrease tumor growth. The next one is isothiocyanates or IT, ITCs. These are found in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Um, and these are, there's different types, but uh, sulforaphane is the most studied. And they are conjugated into glutathione, which we just uh, discussed with selenium. It shows antioxidant enzyme um, properties. Um, they also, They also um, induce other uh, antioxidant enzyme pathways via the activation of NRF2, which is shown um, on the screen. They basically stop uh, cell growth and actually um, decrease your pro-inflammatory cytokines. The next one is polyphenols and phenols. So there is a variety. These are naturally occurring compounds found in fruits, vegetables, cacao, red wine, um, and uh, tea. Today we'll discuss uh, three of them, ECGC, flavonoids, and curcumin, although there is a plethora of them. So ECGC basically acts as a photoprotection of the skin by upregulating DNA repair and inhibiting, inhibiting uh, UVD-induced damage. Okay, flavonoids, they have been suggested to scavenge free radicals from the body um, and inhibit malignant cell proliferation. Curcumin, which is a polyphenol found in the turmeric plant, has been shown to inhibit growth invasion and uh, progression of human melanoma cells through multiple pathways. Um, the pathways are complex. But apart from that, it also serves as a an anti-inflammatory right agent in a lot of um, in a lot of functions. Lastly, polyunsaturated fats. So there is uh, two unsaturated fats. There's omega sixes and omega threes, and it's actually been shown that intake of omega threes, um, or actually your ratio, a higher ratio of omega threes to omega sixes can actually um, have a protective effect on overall cancer, um, overall cancer risk by in reducing inflammatory pathways. Omega-3s essentially reduce, uh, go through inflammatory, uh, anti-inflammatory pathways. So a few, 
Oops. I think it went to another presentation. Yeah, that's mine. <laughs> so back, yeah, back up. I think it skipped. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I can do your talk if you'd like. Yeah, because I don't want to do your talk. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I don't know what I touched. That's okay. We'll figure it out. Why can't I go? Uh... Were you mostly through your presentation? Yeah, just two more slides. Okay. Is this about the right area? Or... No, that's not my presentation. Okay, hang on. I think I went down. Or up. <laughs> Will this be an open book or closed book exam? <laughs> <laughs> just have to wait and see. Right there's nutrition. Yeah, right there. So let's go to this thing. This one here? Yeah. Here you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so two stars of the show, just based on what we discussed, a few antioxidants is the Mediterranean diet. It's characterized by high consumption of plant foods, such as vegetables, beans, fruits, whole grains, and olive oil with moderate to low amounts of uh, red meat and um, dairy products, added sugar and alcohol. Uh, also, the DASH diet is characterized by high amounts also of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, um, and moderate to low intake of red meat and sodium. And so um, these two are well known, um, studied both in cancer prevention um, and general healthy diet. And so these have most of your antioxidants, right? Most of your fiber, most of your whole grains that you need. Just as a rule of thumb to, um, to kind of bring it all in together, um, some cancer risk reduction tips. There's no um, certain diet that we recommend for cancer reduction, but these... Um, Uh, but these uh, three tips can help um, just also are a part of a general healthy diet, but also can reduce your risk for general cancer prevention. So eating two to three cups of fruits and vegetables daily, you want to eat the rainbow, right? We always hear that. So green leafy vegetables, they have your isothiocyanates, which we just discussed, your uh, carotenoids, which are your um, orange um, fruits and vegetables, your flavonoids, those are the darker red, purple, blue um, types of um, food products, and then your dried or fresh herbs and spices, right? We discussed turmeric, but there's also ginger, uh, garlic, um, and then other herbs. Um, we also want to aim for a low fat diet, so limiting our intake of saturated and trans fats, which include butter, margarines, shortenings, processed meats and include uh, healthy fats, right? So flax seeds, avocado, olive oils, um, soybeans, nuts. So this is where your PUFAs, right? Your polyunsaturated fats come in. Um, and then as a general rule of thumb, limiting alcohol consumption or sugary drinks. So the CDC recommends um, only two drinks per day for men and one drink um, per woman. Um, a drink could either be five uh, ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or one uh, to 1.5 ounces of a hard liquor. If you don't drink at all, it's not recommended to start. Um, and so you can, you can generally just not drink alcohol at all. Um, <laughs> another thing is choosing those uh, polyphenols, right? So 
green tea, um, coffee, um, black tea, right? They contain a lot more uh, antioxidants as well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. I'm, I'm certain that will um, raise lots of questions about what we eat and how it affects our health and treatment. Anyway, our, our next speaker, it's an honor and pleasure to have Dr. Batra here, who's uh, a good friend and colleague and certainly an expert in uh, skin cancer. So thank you so much, Sonia, for being here today. And to advance the slide, it's... Ah, perfect. Okay. Thank you all for coming out on a Saturday. I'm Dr. Sonia Bajra. I'm a board certified dermatologist and board certified micrographic dermatologic surgeon. And I uh, really appreciate the invitation from Dr. Esner and the St. John's Cancer Institute, as well as AIM Foundation for Melanoma. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you are here because you personally have been diagnosed with melanoma? So quite a few. And then, uh, but of those in the room who are here to support a family member? So also quite a few, so an even split. How many of you have heard you should use sunscreen? To all of you, and I assume all of the virtual audience as well. How many of you have actually had a doctor sit down and tell you what to look for in your sunscreen? Zero, right? One, two, not that many. And, and I'm sad to say a couple of my patients are in the room and they're not raising their hands. So that's not my favorite thing to see. But I'm going to go through and talk to you a little bit about what to actually look for from a dermatologist's perspective. And it's, I hope, a little more informative than going to Sephora and just telling them you need a sunscreen. So I'm going to walk through with this. And uh, I hope there will be time for questions. I'm going to try to make up a little bit of the time so there's some time at the end. Um, but my task is to talk to you in a little bit more detail about sun protection, which we throw around as a term, sunscreens. And then, of course, I think many people going through the newer standard of care for melanoma, and I'll defer to my colleague Patty to talk to you about this in depth in terms of toxicities. But I do get a lot of questions now that people are on immunotherapy as to how to best protect their skin and manage some of the skin sequelae. So I will delve into that a little bit as well. But we all have heard really elegantly from my colleagues, especially Dr. Hood this morning about melanoma risk factors and Dr. Pincus as well. Um, the things we can't control obviously are the number of moles we have, our genetic makeup, whether we have light like blonde or red hair or light eyes. But the two things we certainly have control over are early childhood burns and intermittent adult burns. And so it's something that we can really talk about because there's a lot of things we can do. And the other aspect is you just heard very elegantly about this question about vitamin D and retinols. And if I have time, I'm happy to address those because I think one thing you should hear from a dermatologist is it's not the sun that's the enemy. Okay. We're all in favor of vitamin D. It's the burns that are the enemy. So knowing how to protect yourself, you know, five to 10 minutes of sun exposure, three to five times a week, no one is going to quibble with that. And certainly no dermatologist who practices in Miami or in LA is going to be against the sun, but we're going to tell you just don't go out there and turn red. Don't accrue the damage that turns you pink or burns because that's where you're going into a higher risk zone. And so you've also heard about this, about childhood burns more than five, that intermittent intense exposure to ultraviolet light, and certainly using a tanning bed, which is a little less common in places like LA, but it still happens. You'd be amazed how many people I see in my clinic in Santa Monica who come in and tan before they go to prom. And you're thinking to yourself, you live in Santa Monica, really? Is this necessary? But it's still prevalent. So really addressing that with people, you know, especially younger people, because melanoma is sadly highest impact in our younger populations. It's, it's kind of good to have that on the radar. So, um, you know, one thing I'm often asked by patients, and I think Dr. Who is talking about this as well, is that we've made so much progress in cancer research. Why is skin cancer one of those ones that every time you look at the chart, really depressingly is going up? And I always just go back to these habits, and these are things we can control because sadly, people 
people really have increased their exposure habits. Um, we spend a lot of time outside. This photo is from Sydney during the COVID lockdown. And this is how many people were still on the beach in violation of quarantine restrictions, which were quite strict in Australia. And you know, we're out there. Everybody's out on the beach, outdoor activities. They're not necessarily protecting themselves. And I'll delve into that. The other thing is, sadly, as our environment is deteriorating, the ozone layer is thinning. So we have 10% more of those really damaging ultraviolet rays that cause those free radicals and that oxidative damage that Ashley was talking about in such detail, reaching your skin and damaging it and leading to some of the changes and mutations that sadly not only age you, but lead to skin cancer. So thought it would be worth mentioning. And I think the other aspect of education when we talk about skin cancer and cancer prevention for, from a skin cancer perspective is that it's not just sun avoidance because that's not realistic, but I think that should be on there. And what I mean by that is being able to structure your life in a way that minimizes the peak hours of ultraviolet exposure. Talking about sunscreens and I'll delve into ingredients. I'm an ingredient nerd, so I'm happy to answer questions about products afterwards. Um, certainly hats, which fan, you know, very fortunately are much more fashionable than they used to be because I'm gonna show you some examples of great hats I've found online. Um, sunglasses, because the other thing we're not talking about today, but we did briefly mention that BAP1 uveal melanoma connection is ocular protection because I am seeing that much more in my population now, sadly, here in Southern California where Ocular melanoma used to be extraordinarily rare, and now I'm sadly seeing more of it. And I think that is directly related to the ultraviolet component. And then, of course, self-exams, not just relying on those hopefully three, six, 12-month checks with your doctor, but really familiarizing yourself with your own skin. You know, pick a window. If it's once a month, give yourself a once-over and list your partner if you have one. And just look for those changes, because while it's really cool to go in and have the software to detect that new mole, I'd say about 50% of the time it's my patient who'll come in and say, you know, I never had this block spot. And then I just saw it on my calf and I'm like, oh, that goes. And, and so that's really extraordinarily helpful for you to be really familiar with your skin as well. And uh, this is a great photo because I think it contrasts with that image I just showed you from Sydney. This is the Australian Public Health Initiative. And because they've had such a high incidence of skin cancer, they've really impacted and improved upon public outreach. And this is one of the photos they're showing of a kid on a beach, super covered up, um, playing some version of a degree do, which is very Australian, and uh, with an umbrella. So I always kind of smile and think like, I wish we all were educating our children like that a little bit more and hopefully educating people that this is not cool, okay? Please don't go out, lie out, fry yourself. These images are still pervasive in the media. I just did a Google search like two days ago before I put together these talk, this talk and these slides. And these images are everywhere, the glorification of being out there, being brown, being burned, being tanned. And I think we just really need to educate ourselves. And like I mentioned, that pre-prom tan, not my favorite. And here in LA, a lot of pre-red carpet tanning as well. So, you know, just kind of making sure that people know that's not a good idea. Um, when we talk about peak UV index hours, this is pretty strict, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If that's not realistic to put your tea time or your walk, to, you know, walk the dog time or your outdoor time outside of those hours, then at least aim for 10 to 2. But that's when we know if you're out, you're going to accrue much more exposure and much more damage. If you have a choice and you can stand in the blinding sunlight or you can stand in the shade, stand in the shade, obviously common sense, but you'd be amazed how many times I've been at school events for my kids. And I'm kind of trying to redirect people into a shady part of the yard when things are going on. And it just didn't even cross people's radar that that's a really simple, really easy thing to do. And then I think whenever I talk to my patients about protective clothing and any of you who've looked at it in the last 20 years, it was pretty scary. You know, like early on protective clothing was suffocating and ugly and nobody wanted to wear it. And I think fortunately in response to the fact that skin cancer is the number one cancer of any type in the United States, very smart entrepreneurs have realized that there is a niche for fashionable, wearable, sun protective clothing. And you don't have to go out and spend a fortune. You can find it at Old Navy and Uniqlo and kind of common brands that are inexpensive, but super helpful to know that even if you don't go out and buy something specifically labeled as sun protective, just put whatever fabric you're holding up to the light. If the light doesn't pass through, it is protecting you from ultraviolet. And that's sort of common sense, but it's good to hear because I think many of us, you know, wear a floppy hat that's mesh. And then when the light is passing through, wonder why they're still burned. So it's, it's just, you know, if it's transmitting light, then ultraviolet is getting through. 
Um, this hat that I have a photo of, I found this online a couple nights ago. You can get it for $16.95 from Amazon. This is what most people think of when I say, oh, get a hat. It's going to protect you from the sun. I can assure you there are many, many better, more fashionable options out there. Just ask any of my kids. I'm always spotted in the bleachers with my big fancy hats. And usually I feel like my small uh, contribution to public health is all the other moms like, where'd you get that hat? And then I, you know, give them a referral, but there are many more fashion ones and you know they're well worth investigating if you're not um, willing to wear this umbrella on your head. So in terms of what to look for in sunblocks, this is also good to hear because everybody can tell you to wear sunscreen, but if you're wearing the wrong one, it's not helping you in any way. And the other thing is that people have this perception they only need sunscreen when they're going to be out and sitting at a park or sitting on the beach. And I tell my patients here in Southern California, rain or shine, put it on. You're going to be in your car. You're going to go run that errand and you're not going to realize you're not protected. So find a daily moisture with sunscreen. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It just has to be something you wear. In fact, preferably not $400 an ounce from Neiman's because you're going to like use such a tiny amount of it because it's so expensive that it's not going to afford you the protection you need. So the other thing that a lot of my patients don't realize is that that term sun protective factor SPF only applies to UVB. And on my first slide, I showed you the kind of two primary wavelengths of ultraviolet that we're concerned about. And while UVB is the narrower wavelength that's more carcinogenic, we do know that the longer wavelength UVA is really damaging and actually penetrates more deeply because it's a deeper, longer wavelength of light. So if you are gonna buy a sunscreen, make sure it says somewhere on the label that it's broad spectrum, because that means it's protecting you from both of those aspects of the ultraviolet spectrum. It's not just the UVB. And I am a fanatic, any of you who are my patients hopefully have heard that physical block sunscreens are just more reliable. They're always broad spectrum. So you're not worried about what part of ultraviolet you're protecting yourself from. They're less allergenic. They're safer in kids. There's a myriad of reasons to always look for that micronized zinc oxide and titanium dioxide product. And I always tell my patients, just be an informed consumer, turn the bottle over, look at that line that says active ingredients. And if it says anything other than zinc or titanium, please don't use it because there's a lot more question marks about the chemical block sunscreens. And I've been saying this probably for two decades now as I've been practicing. And interestingly, in the last five years, I work a lot with the media and we've done segment after segment segment on how we're learning so much more about the systemic absorption of chemical block sunscreens, how many of them degrade to more carcinogenic compounds like benzene. So I feel really vindicated because for 20 years I've been advocating mineral sunscreens and now I'm finding out that there's more and more data to support that. Um, apply a lot of it and I'll go into that in detail in a minute. And then certainly the other thing that many of us fall short is even if you're great about putting it on before you leave the house, reapply if you're a swimmer, if you're sweating, if you're wet and reapply every two to four hours, even if you're just out and about and you know you're gonna be back out in the sun. And in terms of how much you need, because this is a common question, is, is a higher SPF actually better? It's kind of interesting because that curve really plateaus. The difference between an SPF 30, which is a 97% UVB block, and an SPF 50, which is a 98% UV block, is not that much. Now, however, if you've had melanoma, that delta, which is still 50% in that window, is probably worth it to you. But for the average person, going out and spending more money on a higher SPF is just not worth it. Like anything over 30 is kind of icing on the cake. If you're at that 30 mark, you're still getting a 97% block. And I think that's really good. And in terms of what I was getting at, why I'm a fanatic about physical versus chemical sunscreens is this is a really good schematic. Physical sunscreens are minerals that sit on top of your skin and deflect ultraviolet light. So that UV never penetrates and gets into the skin. The way chemical block ingredients work is the ultraviolet is absorbed in your skin and converted to heat through a chemical reaction. So in general, when you think about it intuitively, it makes a little more sense to just put on a shield and go. It's going to work instantly. You don't have to have that 20 to 40 minute lag you should use if you're using a chemical sunscreen to get you know, adequate protection. And like I said, you worry a lot less about longer term toxicities of chemical products. The other thing I always tell my patients is sunscreen is only going to work if you use it everywhere. So this is a common scenario in my clinic where someone tried to remember to use it and sadly didn't get full coverage. So, you know, just a good reminder about putting it on more widely or enlisting someone to help you. Oh, sure. Thanks. 
um, this is what I was alluding to, how much is, uh, you know, sunscreen and makeup is never enough. And very few of us apply enough makeup to actually achieve the SPF on the label. It's not additive. If you're using a whole bunch of SPF five or 10 products, you only get the SPF in the highest number that you applied. And the other thing I tell patients, and especially anyone who's a melanoma survivor, is don't forget lip balm, because we don't have as much protective melanin in our lips. And a lot of times we use gloss. So it's just like the good old days when people put baby oil on and it improved the absorption of light. You definitely, if you're wearing a lip balm or a lip product that is sun protective, try to get one that's matte because it's going to de the gloss is going to decrease the scatter of light. And so I'm going to change gears a little bit and just talk very briefly about skincare during therapy, because many of you actually have had melanoma and you may have been through immunotherapy. And so this aspect of skincare has actually changed a lot in the last 10 to 15 years as melanoma treatments have evolved. And so it's interesting. We used to have a lot of toxicities that were the more classical chemo issues where people would come in and ask me how to preserve their hair and you know the, the more standard things when you're using cytotoxic things that harm the cells. Now, because we have this new advent in melanoma of immune checkpoint inhibitors, which basically take the brakes off your immune system. A lot of the things I'm seeing are because your immune system is more active in your skin. And that leads to a whole different range of skin sequelae. So I'm just going to very briefly, and I'll defer to Patty to talk to you in depth about the some of the other aspects of these medications and their toxicities. But it's sort of common sense again, just like I was talking about sunscreen. If your immune system is in overdrive, the less target you give it, the less irritants you give it, then the better off you're gonna be. So if you already know you're using an immune checkpoint inhibitor or have a loved one who is, the more hypoallergenic, fragrance-free, color-free your skincare regimen can be, the better. So really gentle, not too long, not too hot, showers or baths, scent-free, dye-free, everything from your laundry detergent to your cleanser, to your moisturizer. Like the more you can take away things that are irritants, the better you may fare in this kind of a treatment regimen. And then the other thing is the skin's function as an organ is to be a barrier. It's to be a wall against the outside world. Like your heart is designed to pump, your skin is designed to to seal you from all the irritants and things we come in contact with in the universe. And so it sounds really cliched as a dermatologist to stand up here and tell you to use moisturizer, but it's actually a really good thing because it's going to seal your skin and prevent some of those irritants. So it's not just because we want you to buy a bunch of products. And then this is a really busy slide. You don't have to memorize everything, but these are kind of common things now we're seeing in the dermatology clinic because of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And what this translates to when you come into my office is you're going to say you're itchy and you have a painful skin rash. And so this is because the immune system has gone into overdrive and now it's reacting to all those things. And so when we talk about our armamentarium, as a dermatologist, I am always going to go to the regimen and the topicals first. And Patty can also speak to this because there is a little bit of controversy, right? If you're trying to unleash your immune system on your tumor, you don't want your dermatologist putting you on something that suppresses your immune system to calm down the rash. So that like a systemic steroid is, is a little bit controversial and usually my last resort, but we do have a whole arsenal of anti-inflammatory creams and topicals. Sometimes the topicals are steroids. We have many newer tools in that armamentarium, certainly antihistamines to keep you from being really itchy. And then the really new sophisticated anti-itch medicines as well. In the worst case, so this is my last resort and someone who has a history of melanoma, we can even use light to disperse inflammation in the skin. So it's good to know that there's a whole uh, arsenal and an array of tools we can use if you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of having a skin reaction to your melanoma immunotherapy. So thank you very much for your attention. These are my two kids and two koalas in Australia, where I've learned a lot about skin cancer management. Um, I appreciate all of your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. My email is up as well. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, we'll try to leave most of the questions to the end so we can stay on time. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Laura Fluke, who's one of our surgical oncology fellows at uh, St. John's Providence. And so her mission is kind of give you a little bit of ups and downs of surgery. So thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Esner. And good morning to everyone in the audience and online listening to us. 
I hear we're being broadcast internationally, so this will be my first international broadcast. I'm very excited. <laughs> So I'll be talking to you this morning about what you need to know about surgery and melanoma. So we treat melanoma in a number of ways. Do, do I have the mic I could walk around with? Okay. Can, can you hear me? No. <laughs> Sorry, it's my first time. <laughs> Hello, okay. So we treat melanoma in a number of ways. Surgery is a way that we treat the lesion on the skin. And sometimes we need to evaluate the lymph nodes. There are uh, less commonly times when we operate on other areas of the body. Say if the melanoma has gone to the lung or the liver, we can remove those areas as well. Now, there are some of us in the room that treat melanoma with systemic therapies through an IV. Are there any medical oncologists in the room? Oh yes, I thought there was one. Good, excellent, yes. So medical oncologists are the people that you'll see when you need systemic therapy. And less commonly, we treat melanoma with radiation. Now, are there any radiation oncologists in the room? Yeah, I didn't think so because that's how uncommon it's required. So <laughs> why is the incision so long? We get this question frequently. So those of you that have had melanoma, does, does anyone have a you know, fair size incision? We're not having a competition this morning. You don't have to show me, right? But so you may have returned to your doctor's office and thought, man, was that necessary? Well, the, the length of the incision is really determined by the size of the pigmented lesion, right, the mole, and the depth of it, okay? So, who, any mathematicians in the room? I, I know I'm asking a lot about people's jobs today, but no mathematicians? Well, I'm gonna need you guys to math with me for a minute, but I, I think we can do it, they're simple numbers. So, let's say, uh, I, I have our um, recommended surgical margins up here, so, these are again, based on tumor thickness or the depth in the skin. And so if a tumor, like right here, if it's one millimeter thick, we recommend a one to two centimeter margin. Here, maybe we'll do this. I think this math will be easier. We're gonna go with the easy math because there are no mathematicians. So if it's less than a millimeter, we would take a one centimeter margin. So say this mole, in for those of you that maybe don't use centimeters all the time, because we live in America, <laughs> 2.5 centimeters is an inch, okay? But for, for math's sake, and in medicine, we use centimeters. So if you have a mole that's one centimeter in size, okay, and it was less than a millimeter thick, then we would want one centimeter on either side of it, of a gross margin, right? And gross not being like, ew, right? But, but normal, of normal appearing skin around it. Okay, so we, we mark out that circle. And so if I have a, a mole that's one centimeter and I need one centimeter on either side, what would that be? <laughs> Three, thank you. Uh, applause for the lady. She might be a mathematician. Okay, good. So, so if it's three centimeters high, then we have to multiply that by three centimeters and that will give you the length, okay? And that's because we can't close a circle in a line. When we close a circle in a line, you get these things called dog ears and that's when the skin's raised up at the edges and that skin will catch on things. People, people don't like that because it'll catch on clothing, right? So we want a nice smooth surface on the skin. So that will, so we turn that circle into an ellipse. So the, the height of the ellipse determines the length. So like we mathed, right? So a three centimeter high circle would make, oh no, a nine centimeter high or a nine centimeter long ellipse. So that's how you get these longer scars without dog ears. Thank you for your participation. That was excellent. Okay, 
So uh, as I kind of described in the last slide, that's what an area of excision would look like, right? This eye shape, ellipse, football, what, you know, depending on if you're a sports fan or whatever, whatever shape it is you want. Um, most surgery is another way that sometimes dermatologists uh, manage skin cancer. Okay. I'm sure if, if you've had any other skin cancers, maybe a basal cell or a squamous cell, you've had or heard of Mohs surgery. So Mohs surgery is when a dermatologist, and you know, I'm making this simple, right? I, I don't do this. But so dermatologists that are specialized in Mohs surgery will take layer by layer of skin and look at it under a microscope. And they can do this by freezing that tissue, putting it on a microscope and checking the margins, okay? So they're looking to see if there are any cancer cells that are at the surrounding tissue. And if there are, they go back and they take another layer and look at, look at that tissue. So this is very commonly performed for basal cell and squamous cell cancers, but is more difficult for melanoma because of the way those cells look under the microscope. So after surgery, we, so we operate on someone, we send them home, and I always tell my patients, hey, there are some things I want you to look for. Has, so those of you that have had surgery, do you remember any of the things that we told you to look for after surgery? Like from your incision, things we'd want to know about, right? Redness around the incision, pus drainage from the incision, fevers, none of those things are normal, right? And we want to know about it because those are things that can be signs of a problem after surgery or a complication, okay? So surgical site infections uh, can occur after surgery, and these normally present within 30 days. The incision will appear red, the skin around it may be thickened or hot. Sometimes the patient can experience fevers or chills. If any of those things are going on after surgery, we want to know about it. Sometimes that is treated with antibiotics, or we may have to remove the sutures and drain the infection. So uh, this is maybe one of the more common things we see, we see although it's still, still very uncommon. So seromas. A seroma is a collection of fluid under the skin. When we remove a portion of skin and that, the, the fat under the skin, uh, we close that space, right? We close the skin and close that space and your body wants to fill that space with fluid. That's called a seroma. This is benign fluid, right? It's not infection. Okay. And it won't hurt you. The body will reabsorb it over time. This is commonly seen after we remove lymph nodes from an area. Okay. So that can, it can present as a, uh, like benign swelling, right? Sometimes it can be tender. And if it's tender, and you let us know, we can bring you into clinic and sometimes we'll stick a needle in it and drain it. That's called aspiration. And lymphedema. Lymphedema uh, occurs when we operate on lymph nodes. Historically, this was seen more commonly because back, I don't know, 30 years ago, Dr. Esner, 30, 20, he, you, not so long ago, he, he would know better than I would. But so 20, 30 years ago, when people were removing all of the lymph nodes from an area to check to see if there's melanoma in those lymph nodes, people were, would more commonly experience swelling of that extremity, right? The, the reason we check lymph nodes is to see if the cancer has spread to those, right? But St. John's and Dr. Dr. Esner participated in this huge worldwide study. When we looked at where melanoma drains so that we could check only a few of those lymph nodes so that we no longer had to take all of the lymph nodes out because lymphedema can be debilitating for people. This can result in significant swelling of the arm or the leg that can result in loss of function or range of motion. So now we usually perform something called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, okay, where we use radioactive material 
All right, we have you go to a special place where radiation doctors inject right around the melanoma, the skin lesion, and that will travel through the lymphatic system to the lymph nodes that if the cancer has spread, it would go to those lymph nodes first. Another question that patients ask me a lot is, if we find lymph nodes with the radiation, does that mean there's cancer in the nodes? And no, no, that just means that if your cancer is going to a lymph node, that, the, that node or a couple of nodes are the nodes that it would go to. So those are the nodes that we want to test. So we use the radioactive material and blue dye to find those lymph nodes. Bleeding. Okay. So raise your hands. Anybody seen Gray's Anatomy? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so bleeding after surgery is probably not what you'll see on TV. Uh, the most common, although still uncommon, but the most common we'll see, way we'll see bleeding after surgery is something called a hematoma. So that's when we remove the, the skin and that fat and that space that I was talking about earlier, where sometimes you can get a seroma. If blood were to go into that space, if you were to bleed into that space, then it will fill with blood. And eventually, since the skin is closed, uh, the, the pressure increases so much that the bleeding kind of stops and then that blood co coagulates or turns into a clot right under the skin. And that's a hematoma. It can present with significant bruising, even like a swelling or mass. It can be quite tender. Sometimes there'll even be blood coming from the incision. So if, if those things happen, that, that would be something we'd want to know about. Sometimes we can drain that by putting a needle in it. Sometimes we just observe it, right? If it's not real symptomatic for the patient. And other times we have to take the patient maybe to the procedure room or to the operating room to, to take that blood clot out and reclose the incision. There are certain things that put patients at risk for bleeding after surgery. And those things are a medical history of a bleeding disorder or certain medications. Um, the medications that we most, the you know, most frequent offenders are going to be those that affect your platelets. So things like aspirin or Plavix, if anyone's heard of those. Other uh, medications that, that thin the blood. So sometimes uh, heart disorders or a history of strokes, people will be on those kind of medications. So we usually have people hold those medications before and after surgery for a while. And then graphs, does, you don't have to raise your hand, but does anyone in here have or know someone that had to have a graft? Okay, so I, I, you can, I guess, maybe not listen to, you probably know everything because man, we have, we are, Patients with grafts have a lot of questions and there's usually a lot of back and forth and explanation. You could probably explain it to everyone, but, but I'll do it this time. Um, so uh, we use a graft when we can't make that beautiful, albeit long, incision, okay? When we can't close the skin because the skin is maybe on the scalp or around the ankle or on the foot right? The, the skin there is just not as pliable or flexible as it is on the arm or the leg or on the trunk. So when we can't get the skin to close, we need to use a graft. Sometimes, I guess, we, we can rotate other skin in there, but for all intents and purposes right here, it's, we, we need to use a graft. So there are ways that we take skin from other areas. You'll see this picture over here. And this is from a site where we would take a split thickness skin graft. That means we just shave the top layers of cells. Uh, they're the top layer of skin. Off an area, we usually use the thigh or the abdomen. And then we, we put that skin on the ankle, as you can see up there. But the, this depiction is showing where we have meshed that skin. And sometimes we have to do that to get it to stretch big enough to cover the whole area. And whenever we do grafts, we want to protect them because we've now made an extra wound on this patient that has to heal it. So we protect grafts with a bolster. That's what's shown here, this yellow gauze that's sutured to the skin, so tied to the skin, and then we keep it in place. So this bolster protects that skin graft because the, the worst thing that could happen to a skin graft is if it, it 
the shearing forces could just shear it off, right? So we protect the graft with the bolster. We usually ask patients to keep that clean and dry. So if it's on the scalp, wear a shower cap. They're very fashionable. We've just heard about hats. Shower caps also very fashionable. Uh, or if it's on the ankle, you can uh, you can even get like plastic sacks on Amazon so that you could keep those clean and dry and still shower. Um, the other type of skin graft is a full thickness skin graft. And so when we do that, we take skin, like all the layers of skin from another area and put it uh, over the wound. And those areas we're usually able to close in a thin incision. So, you know, if you have, if we've shaved the top layers of cells off, this is what it would look like. If it's the full thickness skin graft, you would have a longer incision. So these, these are pictures, um, and I don't know what you guys think about them, but I think they look great. <laughs> these are very healthy, uh, nice appearing skin grafts, okay? So uh, on your right, there's a full thickness skin graft. Um, as you can tell, that it's healing very well. And on the left here is a split thickness skin graft where we've actually meshed it and tied it and, and sutured it to the skin. So thank you for joining me today. Um, this is a picture of Melody. So as a fellow, I have the opportunity to work with multiple different surgical oncologists at St. John's Cancer Institute. I have been with Dr. Esner since August and on November 1st, I'll rotate away. Now he always has fellows working with him because he's an, ex an exceptional surgeon and he needs to pass on his knowledge and skills to the next generation. But Melody is his right-hand woman and she's with him all the time. So I just thought you should see her face in case you are to see him in clinic. All right, I'll take questions at the end. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fluke. So we're gonna move on to Dr. Margolin, who's gonna kind of give us the other view of uh, cancer care as the advances in systemic therapy. So thanks, Kim. Well, thank you for letting me invite myself or something like that. And uh, Laura, I didn't know, you know, if the navel surgery thing doesn't work out, you know, stand up comedy uh, could be your, your next stick. All right. I don't think I'm going to be walking around because I need my cheater screen. And what do I do to get my presentation here? David? Arrows to the right and left. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Arrows to the right and left. It's not a Mac. Why didn't you bring me a Mac? Oh, here they are. Okay. Thank you. All right. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you. I hope you uh, enjoy this and I'll try not to use too many really massive words, but uh, if I do, you can ask me later. Um, so actually the title uh, of the talk was something about um, uh, treatment of adva advances in advanced melanoma, but I'm going to um, uh, sneak in a few slides about adjuvant therapy of melanoma because that's, that's important uh, and it's an important part of what we do and what many of you or your loved ones or your friends have experienced. So um, there might be an exam, we'll have to see. Uh, the word adjuvant, you may have heard, um, especially those of you who had adjuvant therapy, but there's a couple of, um, of meanings that are totally different from each other and that I use all the time every day. Um, the first one is uh, what you, you guys are probably most familiar with, which is the treatment that we give you um, usually following surgery. And incidentally, um, I have the privilege of working both with uh, Dr. Esner and Dr. Um, Trevin Fisher, who's in the back somewhere, and Dr. Foshag as well. And um, uh, before I came to St. John's, I had never had such a close working relationship with the surgical oncologist, although they were good at my other institutions. So this has been a lot of fun and a lot of very close uh, teamwork. Um, and then Melody, whom you, you just saw. So adjuvant therapy is what we give you generally after surgery, if it's felt that the risk of melanoma returning is high enough to warrant an intervention um, uh, like the adjuvant therapy, which I'll talk about uh, in more detail in a minute. And then parenthetically, the term neoadjuvant is essentially a made up word, but um, neoadjuvant means treatment 
like that, adjuvant meaning something that helps something else, and neoadjuvant meaning the kind that, that we do before surgery. We'll get back to that and why we do it and what that means um, and what the benefits might or might not be. Uh, so the other meaning of adjuvant is the stuff that the scientists use to make vaccines work. Um, vaccines are usually made from little bits of what we call antigens, something that the immune system has to learn to recognize and will hopefully either prevent an illness, such as uh, you know the vaccines we get against the flu and COVID and so forth, or in the case of, of cancer, uh, more often the research is, is happening on trying to make cancer go away once the cancer has been diagnosed, because for about a hundred reasons, um, it, it hasn't made sense nor has been successful to make preventive vaccines other than for cervical cancer against um, a human papillomavirus. Um, so back to the title, Advances in Adjuvant Therapy and Advanced Melanoma. We've really seen leaps and bounds um, over what I would say was approximately 17 or so years, 2005 or so, representing when we first got to test the drugs that we now use on a routine daily basis, which are called the immune checkpoint blocking antibodies. Um, and I may call them different things throughout the, the, the talk. Um, it was somewhat after that that we uh, also got our hands on um, access to uh, targeted therapies, which are oral agents that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And so our armamentarium, although still quite limited against advanced melanomas is a whole lot better than it used to be um, when I uh, started um, uh, being attracted towards being a melanoma doctor. So again, back to adjuvant therapy, um, we used to have interferon, which was horrible. It did very little, had very little benefit, and it had a lot of side effects. And the side effects, unlike the drugs we have now, were not kind of um, idiosyncratic where they only happen to certain people and not to others. The side effects happen to everybody. Moving on, we were able to get um, these immune checkpoint blocking antibodies, and then they have moved into earlier stages of melanoma as we learn how to give these drugs uh, more safely and more effectively, which is you know double benefit. And I'll show you some graphs of that at the, towards the end of the talk. This concept of neoadjuvant therapy, which is given before the surgical resection, but of course after a diagnostic biopsy, because we can't start treatment with somebody who doesn't have a diagnosis, um, uh, have we've seen with both the immunotherapies and with the targeted agents a very high response rate. And the other benefit is that both at the time of that initial biopsy as well as at the time of surgery, it allows tissue acquisition for either investigation in the lab or in the future when we have biomarkers that'll help us to distinguish patients on what they, what kind of therapy they should get. Um, uh, unlike the current situation where um, Dr. Hugh and Dr. Batra and all of their colleagues in dermatology usually make the first diagnosis with a shave biopsy, and it's usually a very small amount of tissue, uh, going to a, a dermatopathology office, the surgeons, when they do that wide local excision that Dr. Um, Fluke just told you about, usually don't actually find any residual melanoma there, but when they do, it's, it's very little. So we don't get much information, even if we try to study the characteristics of that initial, bi initial biopsy. Um, but if we talk about neoadjuvant therapy, we're often treating a very large, bulky, single-site tumor most often a cluster of lymph nodes, for example, in the axilla or in the groin or maybe internally. And so we can get a substantial amount of tissue before any intervention. And then after the intervention, when the patient goes to the operating room, we, get, we can also get a, a pretty a good sized chunk of tissue for study. So the other things that are provided with neoadjuvant therapy include, include potential for reassurance to both doctors and patients that the treatment is working or an early sign that the treatment isn't working and therefore surgery should be scheduled sooner. Um, it, it's already been shown uh, from a number of studies, although the numbers are still somewhat limited, that we are not risking a significant negative impact on surgery by doing neoadjuvant therapy. In other words, we can see if the tumor's growing and you know, give or take a little bit of time because uh, you're gonna see that immunotherapy can be fairly um, slow in, in acting. But uh, once we're sure that the tumor is growing, if the patient has not been fortunate enough to have a good uh, uh, response, the, uh, the mass can be resected and uh, we're not really losing any time. So um, uh, I just mentioned at the bottom and in the picture that 
um, the concept of neoadjuvant therapy seems rather different than treating ad advanced disease, um, but you gotta be very careful how you look at the statistics and what types of tumors people have um, and, and try to avoid you know, the concept of, of uh, apples or oranges or maybe more like green apples versus red apples as in this picture. Um, so you may not think you need to know about mutations, but you kind of do because um, it may come up in your journey that we need to know whether your uh, tumor, whether your melanoma has the most common mutation, um, the BRAF V600 mutation, which has a drug, a drug ability associated with it, or whether there are other mutations that may influence the behavior of tumors that have or don't have a BRAF mutation. And then I'll tell you about neoangin. So a driver mutation, I think that um, uh, Dr. Or Miles Picus, because uh, told us earlier um, about what drivers are and what oncogenes are. There are suppressor oncogenes and there are sort of activating um, oncogenic oncogenes such as the BRCA. Uh, well, no, that's, that's a, a suppressor as well. Sorry, my bad. Um, but the BRAF um, mutation, which occurs in about half of melanomas in Caucasian individuals with uh, mel uh, melanomas other than the acral melanomas or the internal mucosal melanomas or the melanomas growing in the eye. Uh, and that's druggable with a couple of, uh, of drugs that we use fairly often now. Um, but it is neither necessary nor sufficient. Not necessary because you can have as I said, half the patients uh, have their melanomas without that mutation. And it's not sufficient because we know that it can be found in, in moles, but those moles are not all going on to develop melanoma. Um, the site where the mutation occurs confers this activation on a specific protein that uh, hastens the speed at which melanoma cells um, turn over and activates other pathways in the cell that give rise to its behavior. Uh, passenger mutations are those that influence, I already said, the, the behavior uh, of either a, a driver or, um, or a melanoma that doesn't have a driver, and they include the CDKN2A, which you saw was also one of the germline mutations that people can be born with and have in their family as a risk factor for developing melanoma in the first place. Uh, but then it can be also acquired. Neoantigens are those antigens that the tumor is not born with but picks up over time and probably due in part to UV or other carcinogens in the, in the uh, environment and may be able to be the focus of the immune response um, to vaccines. And in, indeed, the um, neoantigen vaccine approach was already going on at Moderna, for example, when COVID came along and they quit and the scientists there quickly turned their, their uh, efforts from the uh, approach that was being used to make neoantigen uh, vaccines to neoantigen vac or antigen specific um, COVID vaccines, such as for the, uh, the spike protein. Um, doctors Hanjo in Japan and, and Allison and MD Anderson in, in Houston won the Nobel Prize in 18 uh, for medicine for the development and application of immune checkpoint blocking antibodies. Those are the ones whose names you've heard and you will hear. Uh, Jim um, is here and he, um, I think his wife made him dress up for this. She's a scientist as well. Um, and this is him when he's not making, you know, record-breaking discoveries uh, in science and uh, oncology. He plays the harmonica, which he calls the harp, either with this group called the Checkpoints or, um, uh, or with a group, um, or with, uh, with Willie Nelson, which um, uh, has led to his going on tour at times with, with Willie Nelson. Um, Dr. Bill Kalin also shared a Nobel Prize in, in 19 for hypoxia genes in renal um, oncogenesis. So cancer advances really have been making history. And of course, the CRISPR that Jennifer D uh, Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier won the prize for, I think the next year, uh, has also been used extensively in cancer. Um, I don't want you to try to figure out this, this slide. It's just to kind of remind me to remind you that we call this, this juncture between the T lymphocyte, the, the primary cell of the immune system, and either a dendritic cell, which is another important cell in the immune system, um, or the T cell and the cancer cell, that's called the immune synapse, the place where those things uh, join together and usually uh, feature 
uh, many different um, pairs of receptor and what's called ligand. So if the receptor looks like that and ligand looks like that, uh, one fits into the other. They're highly specific based on their sequence of their um, uh, amino acids in the protein, and they exert uh, important and very specific functions. And that's uh, what we also know about how these checkpoint blocking antibodies work. Um, if you want to know more, we'll have to wait till the question and answer period. So what is the benefit of, of um, immunotherapy or sorry, adjuvant therapy in stage three melanoma? Um, everything we do and everything we think about and how we, how we you know, design new studies are based on, on graphs that look like this. And the ideal graph looks kind of like the one on the right where you have a, a pretty nice separation between the curves and they start to separate very early and they end up with plateaus that are, that are separate, which would suggest that what we did with whatever the therapy is, might have had curative, you know, people are, are, are surviving and are being cured more with one treatment than with either the control or, or with no, no therapy. Um, this refers to uh, the use of those targeted therapies in um, patients with stage three melanoma, where half the patients were randomized to get the treatment and half were not, were randomized to get uh, either it was observation or, or placebo, sorry about that. Um, and, uh, that was followed at, at 60 months or five years and made a substantial difference. However, uh, as I told you, only half the patients have that mutation and um, we tend to use immunotherapy more for reasons I'll get to. But interestingly, I want you to look at this part of the curve, these two curves. Um, these two curves show that there's no separation between the immunotherapy curve and the no immunotherapy curve uh, early on, and that reflects the fact that it takes some time for the immunotherapy to work, and also the fact that immunotherapy overall benefits a somewhat uh, lower percentage of patients initially than the uh, targeted drugs. Um, but in the long run, probably more patients do well with immunotherapy and are cured. And these curves are actually... Um, progression-free or relapse-free survival curves. So these are not overall survival curves. Uh, in order to get to the long-term overall uh, lifespan benefit, we're gonna have to uh, use a lot longer um, uh, follow-up and see what happens to those curves. Um, the benefit of adjuvant therapy in stage two disease is much, much lower. And as you can see that from the, uh, these curves, even for the treatment group that didn't get treated, the curves do not go down as low because uh, this, the um, stage two patients have a much better prognosis. We are using adjuvant therapy, uh, so far just immunotherapy, in some high-risk stage two patients, which happen to be uh, at a high, which happen to have a higher risk for relapse than some of the very low risk stage three patients. It's just one of the ironic things that we learn when we, when we do staging. Um, we need better ways of staging and a lot more molecular information, but for now, uh, this is what we have. So stay tuned on that. Now, what about advanced disease? I'll try to pick up the pace, but I don't want to talk too fast um, for you not to uh, understand me. So as I said, targeted drugs work fast and well with a 60 to 80% remission rate, but they're temporary. They don't have a cure potential. And the op absolute opposite um, uh, applies to immunotherapy, where the best response rates are between 40 and 55%, you'll see curves later, uh, but they tend to be maintained. Um, not always, but often. The mutations and the alterations uh, of genetic um, machinery that cause people to escape from the control of the targeted agents follow a very Darwinian sort of path. And, and then the selection of the fittest of those cells that had um, mutations that allow them to survive despite the targeted agents are what cause uh, resistance. Um, so uh, I think I've already mentioned what's in the bottom and I'm not gonna repeat that. Um, sometimes we combine targeted agents in immunotherapy and sometimes we sequence them. Treatment with um, immunotherapy first does not appear to reduce the chance that later on, if patients relapse, they will go on to um, uh, respond to targeted therapy. That, I'm talking about patients with BRAF mutated um, melanoma. Of course, you can't use targeted 
agents with those who don't have a BRAF mutation. However, treating with targeted therapy first seems to reduce the later response to immunotherapy. Now, we, we knew that, and that's how we proceeded with ch uh, choosing treatment, but we only knew it from retroactive uh, data um, uh, review because uh, we tend to pick targeted therapy for patients who have very aggressive disease and need to respond right away or have a lot of disease. And we would treat with immunotherapy for those who have slow growing or a smaller amount of disease because they can afford to wait for that response to happen. But uh, my friend, uh, Mike Atkins and a bunch of other people got together and designed what really had to happen and what this is the, the lifeblood of, of, uh, you know, of, of, of cancer, which is to do a prospective trial where patients are randomized to one versus the other treatment and then um, you know, finish the treatment and at the end, look back and say who did better and in what ways did they do better. So this was ultimately called the DreamSeq trial. Um, and uh, this trial was recently published and it had definitively established the superiority in, and this is in overall survival now, for um, starting with immunotherapy in BRF mutated melanoma patients. And um, uh, I would like to think that so much progress is being made that um, uh, this concept of having to decide about what sequence um, we should use will become relatively obsolete as we get better treatments. Um, so this uh, famous line from The Graduate and very old movie that only some of you will remember is that, you know, I just want to say one word to you. And do you remember what it was? Plastics. Plastics. So my word is biomarkers. We need them. We're working on them. Uh, Dream Seek, uh, Dream, Dream Seek's graph is here. And again, I just want to point out to you what you may have seen, that the targeted therapy first, followed by immunotherapy, only if they relapse, started out with a much higher curve because it works right away. The immunotherapy first, followed by targeted therapy, if they relapsed, fell down uh, faster because of that slower time it takes and the fewer patients who benefit and, um, and but only then came out ahead with these plateaus. Now, I just wanna point out these plateaus don't necessarily mean that these patients had plateaus with what they got first or what they got second. It was whatever they got in the sequence of what they got. And it'll, it'll have to be another analysis in another paper that'll show us what the inflection point was for each of those two um, curves. Uh, again, a figure that's a little complicated if you're not used to looking at figures like this. And it's just to introduce to you that we do have newer agents among these immune checkpoint blocking antibodies. The latest is actually a, a fixed dose combination of two drugs that Bristol Myers uh, put together and they were very clever. They put them together so you, you really can't change the dose of either one. But then we don't do that anyway. We, we either, if there's toxicities, which you'll hear about from Patty, we we, we hold the dose, we treat the toxicities, and we either do or we don't resume therapy depending on how severe and how quickly reversible the toxicities were. But the Opdualag, which is named after Opdivo or Nivolumab and LAG3, and then Dual, amazing, a drug name that actually makes sense, um, has proven, I'll show you a graph with that in a, in a minute, um, here, here's the graph, the initial graph with the Opdualag. It's, again, it's not as exciting as we'd like it to be. Again, it looks like an immunotherapy uh, graph where things fall down at the beginning and only, only then do they start to, to even out and, and there's a difference between the curves. The overall survival curve, uh, as is often the case, didn't quite meet the, the statistical significance um, uh, that the, uh, that the progression-free survival did, but it may be that over time when those curves, if the curves stay separate, that we'll see an, uh, a statistically significant survival benefit. I think this is close to my last slide. No, it's, there's a couple more, but I'll stop soon. Um, so where's the bar for immunotherapy in 2022? I uh, acknowledge April Salama, one of my colleagues at Duke for this slide that's animated. And so ipilimumab or your voice, um, low response, substantial toxicity. Uh, PD-1 blockade, that is pembrolizumab or, or um, nivolumab, both, um, uh, both of which you're probably familiar with, higher, substantially higher response and a much lower toxicity than ipilimumab. If you put the two together, you get um, a much higher response and higher toxicity. And then you add uh, the uh, Opdualag and you go way down on the toxicity and almost as far up as you can go in the therapeutic efficacy. So that's really become a, a go-to drug for um, patients who don't fit into clinical trials, uh, which should always be the first choice. 
um, uh, and who have advanced melanoma. So I'm um, not going to go through that. This is what you're going to hear about from Patty. And um, uh, it just so happens that when you give the best, immun uh, the best um, immunotherapies to patients with very small volume brain metastases of melanoma who don't require steroids and don't have symptoms that re require radiation, they do just as well as patients um, uh, who, who get those other therapies. And they do just as well as the outside of the brain metastases do. And Patty's very familiar with this curve because we started this trial uh, when I was, uh, was at City of Hope before, took it to Washington, then, then came back and um, uh, got it into the New England Journal as the first publication. It doesn't work so well when the patients have symptoms or steroids. Um, going to skip that. And just uh, to remind you or to tell you that we're also getting into cell therapy, T-cell therapy for melanoma. The cells come from a tumor. We, they're grown in the lab. They're given sprinkles of growth factors. They're expanded. They're put in the freezer for a while until the patient needs them. And then they're given back to the patient with some chemotherapy. We won't go into why. Um, I don't want to take uh, go too far beyond my time. And I'll stop there and say thank you very much. This slide also came from April. And some of you know that I'm really um, a big, big fan of languages. And so this was a, a good slide for me. So I thank you very much. So the next, and I believe it's the last uh, formal uh, slide will be, um, I'm sorry, presentation will be given by Patty Jo Carruth, who is a um, very experienced uh, research nurse uh, whom I worked, had the pleasure of working with at the City of Hope. I don't remember how many years. Um, and Patty's now at Stanford where she's doing research nurse education efforts and uh, well capable of it. Uh, as we learned last night when we had to teach cancer to the lady in the shop before we went to dinner. So um, uh, welcome Patty. Karu. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see everybody. And um, I want to thank Dr. Margolin for inviting me. Um, I did speak at this uh, conference a few years ago, and I really enjoyed it. So I um, lived down here in Southern California for several years. And so it's nice to come back and visit as now I'm up in the Bay Area. Um, just a little bit about my, my history is that I'm a registered nurse. And I have a national certification in oncology for many years, 30 some, 40 years. Um, but I started nursing when I was 10, so that's why I don't really look that old. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot of um, things in my career, uh, one of which I enjoyed the most was doing the clinical trials at City of Hope, um, specifically in melanoma. And so it's been fascinating to see the advances here. So um, this is my first slide. So my official title is Nursing Professional Development Specialist uh, in clinical trials at Stanford. So we have a lot of nurses um, in the hospital that are new to clinical trials. So it's my job to educate them and teach them about what that means and what's, what it's all about for them taking care of patients as well as the patients themselves. I have no disclosures. Um, so these are some objectives to improve early recognition and education and management of, of toxicities. Uh, identify strategies to manage them, as well as to determine some key points for patient education. How many patients in this room have had checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy? Anybody? Quite a few. So you can um, share with me if you need to, or we can talk later um, about what you've experienced. And if so, you know, it's amazing to me because sometimes people go through this therapy and have no toxicities at all. And some people get really bad toxicities after one or two doses. So it's really fascinating to see. Um, and this has been talked about already a little bit today, um, but the tumors have to evolve mechanisms to evade the immune system because your immune system is meant to, to attack and kill cells that don't belong in the body, right? Um, but the cancer inactivates the T cells. And so they can't recognize the cancer to be able to um, either prevent you from getting cancer or, or treat it itself. So the immune checkpoint inhibitors 
like was mentioned already, um, function by reactivating the T cells to allow them to do their job and to, to treat the cancer and attack the cancer. Um, so it decreases that immune suppression by the tumor and does restore the ability of the T cells to eradicate the tumor. So immunotherapy, we talked about that um, a bunch today. Uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors or ICI uh, is a fairly new category of drugs over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years maybe, um, that's used very widely to treat cancer and in, in, um, in a lot of different types of origins. So these medicines were designed to work with immunotherapy or designed to work with your immune system, I'm sorry, to treat the cancer. So they work differently than traditional chemotherapy. So if anybody has had traditional chemotherapy, you know that it's a chemical we put in your body and it attacks every different type of cell that's in your body, which is why you get mouth sores, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you lose your hair and all kinds of things happen. Um, the immunotherapy is more specific in that it works with the immune system. Um, but the one thing that we wanna make sure that you know is uh, that the side effects can occur shortly after beginning with therapy um, or that even after therapy is completed, sometimes years after therapy is completed. So it's important that you, you carry that information with you and you share that with all your medical providers. Um, the one other thing that I think is extremely important is that if you end up going to the emergency room for any reason, and if you're on immunotherapy or targeted therapy, that you um, inform the emergency room personnel so that they can treat you appropriately for the symptoms that you're presenting with because it's nothing worse than going to the emergency room and, and being treated for a lot of different symptoms, but not getting to the cause of why the symptoms are happening, right? So that outcome is not always the best. Um, the immune checkpoint inhibitors have become pretty much the standard of care for many different types of cancers. And the clinical trials we were doing at City of Hope they were um, mixed in for all different kinds. And I remember being uh, at a meeting where the um, drug company for Keytruda had said that, you know, in January of the coming year, that it was going to be approved for 14 different types of cancers, which is just amazing. And I was just like, wow, that's really incredible. And every time I read anything, it's always being um, advanced to other different types of cancers or in other different combinations of therapy. So the side effects that occur are because the healthy cells in your body are attacked by the immune system when it's activated to fight the cancer. And so as Dr. Margolin said, and I believe um, other speakers have mentioned that the pictures on the cells where the, the tumor and the immune system meet and talk are the immune checkpoints, right? And so that's where the drugs are targeted to do their work. So they... Um, prevent attack by, un, or by blindfolding the immune cells initially, but the ICIs uh, remove the blindfold, allowing the immune system to actually attack the cancer cells. So immunotherapy effects, um, again, against cancer to cause destruction of tumors, but it can also be against the normal body um, organs. And this is called immune-related adverse events, or we call them IRAEs right? Um, they can be very mild or they can be life-threatening. And early treatment of side effects is a better outcome. So it's extremely important to keep in contact with your healthcare team and to know when to call and who to call. And regardless of whether you think you call, you should call, okay? Because it's always better to know what's happening uh, with you um, from the healthcare team so that they can know if, if intervention needs to occur, okay? And again, side effects can even occur after therapy has ended. So this is a picture you've seen a couple times. Um, and this is related to the different body systems and organs that can be affected by immunotherapy. And if you think about it, um, everything that has the word itis next to it is kind of an inflammation. And um, like puritis is itching and hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. So all of those different organs that can be affected by immune therapy um, have similar names like pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. Um, uveitis is inflammation in the eyes. Encephalitis is the brain. So these are some pictures of just some of the different parts of the body that 
um, shows the effects of the immune therapy on those different organs. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So when we were doing clinical trials in uh, City of Hope, we were doing a combination of therapy of ipilimumab or Eurovoy. I put both those names up there because you probably might be more familiar with one versus the other. Um, and Opdivo. So ipinivo is what we called it. And um, the ipi was four doses of ipi and uh, nivo was initial doses followed by maintenance therapy. But it's very hard to get through that combination of therapy, which has been discussed a little bit already. So we'll talk about that some more. And it talks on the right-hand side of the um, slide about what type of target that that drug has. And so that this list has grown since I started and we had um, ipilimumab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab. And all the drugs below that are all new in the last, you know, probably five years have been developed and are being used for different um, types of disease. So as you can see at the bottom, they're FDA approved for many different types of cancer, melanoma, renal cell cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, head and neck cancer, urethral cancers. When I was putting the slide together and I was doing my research, you know, the list had about five things and then I just kept typing and then I ran out of room, so I stopped. Um, but there's lots of different indications for um, immune checkpoint inhibitors today. This is another picture of the cells, which shows how the checkpoint inhibitors release the breaks on the immune system. And I don't expect anybody really to understand this unless you work with this every day. But um, it's just very interesting, as you can see, it's uh, very similar to what Dr. Margolin had, you know, the dendritic cell and the T cell and what happens in between the two cells and then the tumor cell on, on the side with the T cell um, and the checkpoint um, areas between those where the immunotherapy interacts. So this just talks about how the signaling is promoted and expressed. And I think this is probably a little bit too much detail for today, but the pictures are really interesting. I'm a visual person, so I like pictures um, and the colors are nice too, but it talks about how the um, immunotherapy works and how it interacts between the immune system and the cancer cells as well. So a general assessment that's required prior to starting immunotherapy um, by your physician and medical team is to just go over your medical history. If you have any comorbidities, which is underlying diseases, anything with your skin or your endocrine system like diabetes or um, gastrointestinal, if you have a history of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or any pulmonary history, you know, asthma, pneumonia, those kind of things. Um, as well as your medication list is very important to go over so that everybody is, starts on the same page before you start on your immunotherapy. And patient and family education is crucial um, because sometimes patients can't really um, speak for themselves when it comes to the side effects that they might be experiencing or even the treatment that you're receiving. And we'll talk about that as we move forward quickly, but it's important that both the family and the patient know what drugs you're receiving, what dosages you're receiving, what kind of calendar you're on, where you are in your treatment cycle. Um, how about the side effects that you could experience? What is the time frame that those might be um, expected to occur? And how do you communicate with your healthcare team? Do you call them? Do you page them? Do you message them on the, the portal? You know, sometimes it's more important to make a phone call than do a message on a portal because it's urgent and you need to reach them. Um, appropriate skin care during immunotherapy treatment. Um, it says initiate now. And I know that was um, discussed earlier in a presentation, which I thought was really nice kind of to go along with this presentation too. So another picture of the body and some of these I really like um, that show the different organs in your body and how the immune therapy can affect um, you as well as you're going through your treatment for your cancer. So the two graphs um, on the side, we grade toxicities on a scale of one to four and one to two is fairly mild and three to four is more severe. And obviously four is very um, intense requiring hospitalization. So you can see on this slide for three to four, you know, the, the numbers are much lower than one to two, but it still means that they need to be addressed and they need to have some action taken. 
So the five pillars of toxicity management, and I really like this graphic from CITSI, um, the immune or the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer. And it talks about prevention, you know, what we can do to help prevent your toxicities, what we could, uh, what we know that we can anticipate from the therapy that you're receiving what we need to teach you on how to detect and identify those, what we need to do to treat you, and how we need to monitor as we go forward. So um, the thing I'm going to talk about on this slide, I believe, is that just to remind you that any organ can be involved. Okay, the most common sites include the skin, which we saw a beautiful picture of that rash that the patient came with that uh, went through the whole body. Um, the colon is very important. Um, adrenals, which have to do with your um, body function of pituitary and your pancreas, the lungs and the liver. So any anything that can happen with these organs is really important to know about. Um, Sometimes they develop within the first few weeks of therapy, um, but they can occur years after discontinuation of therapy. And I remember hearing uh, one of our colleagues at City of Hope talk about that to the physician group because it was something that people really didn't know at the time. You know, normally when you finish chemotherapy, you know, your side effects generally subside after you finish your therapy, but for immunotherapy, they can go on for a long time, but they can happen after a long period of time. Um, so the most important thing on this slide is that you um, should expect to have lab tests and physician visits while you're on this kind of therapy, because we need to keep an eye on you and we need to monitor. We need to check your labs. We need to look at your skin. We need to talk to you about whether you're having any aches or pains, um, whether anything is impacting your activities of daily living. And this talks about the, um, the difference in the types of drugs that are being administered and the incidence of grade three or higher immune related adverse events. And you can see that um, the middle one has the highest or the middle one has the middle range, but then if you combine the drugs like we talked about earlier, then the incidence of that goes up. Um, this I found uh, on the Cancer Council and I thought it was really nice because it talked about it in lay language. Right, it talked about that, uh, what is fatigue? It's tiredness that does not go away with rest, right? And, and we're all, I think probably today, a little fatigued because we're tired. Um, but after you take a nap, you probably feel better. But this type of fatigue related to these kind of therapies does not improve. Um, it's caused by inflammation that goes throughout your body. And, and this is really nice because it talks about what things that you should look out for as far as a symptom. If you have a rash, it could be bit bumpy and itchy. It could be red. Um, diarrhea and the abdominal pain in the colon, you could have bloating, um, frequent diarrhea, explosive diarrhea. You could have inflamed colon that requires you to go in the hospital. So it's just really important to know what potentially could happen and what you should be on the lookout for. Uh, which side effects are more common? I think skin rash and itching is pretty much at the top of the list. We see a lot. Uh, we uh, work very closely with our dermatologists. I know that um, many of the patients that um, I was involved with treating with Dr. Margolin at City of Hope, um, all, most of them ended up in the dermatology office um, for assessment and treatment of some skin related issues. The bowel, diarrhea and inflamed colon and liver, hormone related thyroid disorder, um, lungs can be called inflammation of the lungs or pneumonitis, muscles and joints, um, aching. And I remember we had a patient that was just like, you know, I just ache, my shoulders ache, my, you know, my arms ache. And it's like, well, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how bad does it affect your activities of daily living? And it was impacting his activities of daily living significantly enough that we had to provide some treatment for him. Um, the fatigue, I love this little picture because that's how I feel some days, but <laughs> uh, less common are nervous system, kidneys, eyes, um, pancreas, and heart. So a typical presentation uh, are, are these, like was discussed, the maculopapular rash um, with itching can be on the trunk and to lesser extent, the upper limbs spreading to the extremities. Um, so this is very helpful to have um, visualization, you know, the doctor's going to want to look at your skin head to toe and, um, topical creams was discussed as, you know, a treatment, 
um, recommendation for this type of rash and um, you know, ultimately could require uh, oral steroids. Diarrhea and colitis, hepatic um, inflammation. And interestingly enough, often this is asymptomatic. You don't know that there's something going on with your liver. Okay, thank you. Um, until you have your lab tests. So it's very important to make sure you keep your appointments and get your lab tests. Um, pancreas as well. Some people have abdominal pain, but we check those enzymes as well in your labs. And endocrine, we look for your sodium and your cortisol and your, your blood sugar and make sure that we can keep that on track too. Less common symptoms, we're gonna skip through that here. Um, dermatologic toxicities, I tried to put this in um, something that was more understandable. And you know, both flat patches and bumps, and that's what maculopapular means. So that's the way you know what it looks like. This is just kind of a, a guide to um, treatment. You, whether you continue the immunotherapy, you stop it, you hold it until the symptoms get better, and then you can restart your therapy. Um, this is a very severe type of dermatologic toxicity. I don't think I have time to go into that as I've been given the signal. Um, vitiligo is very interesting to see because this is a change in the color of the skin. And um, this is related to the immune system and it's a permanent thing, it doesn't go away. Um, but it, sometimes it's good to see because it means that the immune system's at, being activated. Gastrointestinal toxicities, diarrhea and colitis. We want to know how many episodes of diarrhea you have, how often are you going? What is your baseline? How many times a day do you normally go to the bathroom? And how many more times a day are you now going than you were originally? That's really important to know. Um, let's skip that one. Endocrine toxicities, we're talking about the thyroid. Uh, it's very important that we measure your thyroid levels and because the correcting those might require um, intervention with thyroid medication to supplement. Um, your body, and that's um, technically probably an uh, ongoing treatment that you're going to require. Um, the thyroid levels go up and then they go down, and so it's important to just have ongoing monitoring of that to know when to start therapy. Um, we talk, This is um, discussing the pituitary gland and how important it is to measure those um, lab levels and whether that's going to require intervention with oral therapy because that's going to probably go on for, for life. Pancreas, uh, we talked about that. We had a gentleman come in with really uh, elevated pancreas enzymes, and we had to stop and hold his treatment for a while until his pancreas improved. Pulmonary toxicities, this can be very serious and, and end up in hospitalization because the lungs get severely inflamed. You can see it sometimes on a chest X-ray, but you know very well on a CT scan. Sometimes people go through a bronchoscopy to do a biopsy, but um, any time that you need additional oxygen to breathe, it's very, very important that we know that treatment for that is prednisone therapy, which we'll get to. I have to speed through this. Um, body aches, um, your kidneys, um, cardiac toxicities can occur, ocular toxicities can occur. So anytime you have any kind of um, symptom that is not your normal, it's important to discuss that with your physician. We do labs, as you probably know, we do physical exams, um, a dermatologic exam, and, and we do assessment of your whole body. So this is a team effort. This is my favorite slide, because I think it's important that everybody works together to get, to get you through. The physician, the advanced practice nurse, your nurse, the infusion center, when to contact your care team. This is important if any of these things are happening. Um, if you change physicians or if you're prescribed a new medicine or you go to the hospital, it's important that everybody knows that this is what you're going through and these are the medications that you're receiving. Um, so we, we talked about whether or not we're going to hold therapy, and this is the grading system I talked about, grade one to four, and one is mild, two is moderate, three is significant, and sometimes it warrants stopping therapy. You may have to stop it temporarily until the symptoms resolve. You may have to stop it permanently, depending upon how severe the symptoms are. Um, usually they're symptom specific, but, but it can be fairly standardized as far as the treatment of any immune related adverse events. And so steroids are generally the drug of choice when it comes to immune therapy, unfortunately, because they're not the easiest things to take as a patient. 
um, but they do, uh, they are very effective, but they have to be taken over a period of time and they have to be tapered. You can't go off of them cold turkey. And you have to follow the instructions very closely that you're provided by the medical team about when you're supposed to decrease your dose and how often you're supposed to take your medicine until you get to a level where, where things can be calmed down and maybe you can restart your therapy. Communication is the key. Um, important again, work as a team. But this is really important. I think it's an immunotherapy wallet card that is provided by the Oncology Nursing Society. And this is the link here on the slide. Um, it's something that is searchable online. And it, this is a picture of it. It shows that um, something that you can carry in your wallet that documents, you know, who you are, what your diagnosis is, what your therapy is, so that if you do go to the hospital, you do go to the doctor, you do go to the emergency room, you can pull this out and they can know what it is that you're receiving so that they know what symptoms that they need to address with you. Um, these are just some pictures which I thought were interesting response to therapy. It's been amazing, some of the responses that we've seen to therapy. Um, you know, just... Um, Amazing. Um, this is a picture of a patient with a squamous cell carcinoma and received one of the drugs that was on clinical trial at City of Hope. And um, this is the improvement that he showed over time with his disease. So it was much less disfiguring um, and much improved outcome. So the NCCN, uh, which has been discussed um, briefly today as well from others, has guidelines for patients. And you can find those on the nccn.org and you can type in guidelines for patients for immunotherapy side effects. It's a very useful tool. It's a, it's a fairly extensive document. It's like 60 pages, but it's, but it's written very clearly and it's easy to understand. So again, multidisciplinary approach is important. All of these specialties sometimes get involved in your care, whether it's the pulmonologist, if you're having lung problems, the dermatologist, the cardiologist, the pharmacy is extremely important, obviously medical oncology and nursing. And these are some resources that I have listed here. Um, and I'm just gonna give these some references and this is my favorite slide. So physicians and nurses as a team must assess and educate patients regarding the side effects of immunotherapy and together we can make a difference. So thank you for your time and attention, I appreciate it. Great, thank you so much, Patty. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna give ourselves like five minutes to collect the questions. And then, um, cause we wanna get the online ones. And then once that's done, we'll have our panelists all come up here and uh, we can ask the questions, okay? Yeah, yeah, so is there any more that are coming in from online? This is online and in. Okay, so give us five minutes to sort through them. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Perfect timing for you. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Can I just, can I just leave it like this? That's fine. Do you have, do you have visuals? I, no, not really. You I can don't? just okay. talk. Well, yeah, okay. here we go. Hi. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Sam Guild. I am the president of AIM at Melanoma. Um, we are here to support you. Um, in every way that we can, but I think it's important for you to understand why I do what I do. So there's multiple reasons, but here are the, for me, the most personal ones. So in 2003, my sister, Charlie, who was 26, passed away from melanoma. Her prognosis at the time was nine months. And so this foundation was started um, by my mother, who ran this foundation many years until 2020. It is now the largest international melanoma organization um, in this disease. And I've been with the foundation for many years. Um, I left um, a law firm to, uh, practicing law and I became part of this foundation in 2008. So as I indicated to you, I have personal reasons to make sure that we end melanoma in our lifetime. We have three main missions. Um, public policy is one. Um, since we're in California, I will mention I'm proud to say that California, with the work that I did and many others here in the state, we um, became the first state to ban minors under the age of 18 from indoor tanning devices. And we are involved in public policy in many other ways um, in legislation. We're also involved in research. 
Um, we have our own um, fresh frozen primary tissue bank. I belong to a couple of um, cooperative groups, ECOG and SWOG, where they are running multiple um, melanoma trials and I'm the patient advocate on that. So that's some of the research that we do. But of course, we're here about educating all of you about melanoma. So I'm gonna spend a couple of moments in talking about that. So we do a lot of work um, for healthcare providers helping to educate them, but for melanoma patients and their families, here is some of the things that we can do for you moving forward. So you heard a lot about side effects from treatments, both immunotherapy and targeted therapy, and we have patient action plans that we have developed in each of the treatment options to help you recognize and manage those side effects while you're on treatment and past treatment. We also have a physician assistant who works um, in a melanoma clinic. She's on, um, an oncology PA who can answer your questions. She is, it is totally free. You can reach her online. You can reach her um, using the internet. Um, and she has some other additional resources that she provides that I'll mention that in a moment. We also are very fortunate that the lovely Dr. Kim Margolin does something called In Plain English for us. And in our newsletters, she takes very complex medical issues and turns it into language that we can all understand. So, you know, she did want, she's done a couple on brain metastasis. She mentioned dream seek. She's done one in that. Um, and so you can always look for those. And if you have specific topics that you think would be helpful, of course, let us know. Um, we have a clinical trial matching service because, um, you know, clinical trials, you know, certainly will help bring, up, bring us to a cure and improve quality of care. We have a video library of past symposiums. You heard about gut biome, um, I think was a question that's in there, um, gut health. We have web um, videos on that. Um, Melissa, who's our physician assistant, does a webinar series as well, where she brings in an expert. Uh, we just did one recently on CT DNA. She's done one on physical activity. Lots and lots of those. We also, um, we understand the importance of addressing your emotional well-being, And we're fortunate that Ray Liu, who's the director of survivorship at Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco, does a series called Beyond the Clinic Living Well with Melanoma and addresses some of the psychosocial aspects of having a melanoma disease. Survivor stories, we provide lots of survivor stories. It's important to bring hope. Um, again, I've been part of this community I was dragged into it, obviously not willingly in 2003, and we've come a long way. And having hope and hearing from other people, I know people now are 10 plus years out from having a diagnosis. And I think it's important that we continue to share those stories. We have a peer-to-peer -peer connect program where we match um, newly diagnosed people with, we call veterans, although they're not old, we do have some young people. So we can match somebody who can help you directly um, and support you, um, emotion, your emotional needs. And of course we have our Steps Against Melanoma Walk where we not only raise money for research, but of course bring people together to help raise awareness um, and to provide emotional support during those events. So again, I just really wanna um, emphasize the fact that even though the event is gonna be ending soon this morning, we are all here, St. John's, AIM at Melanoma, other people in this room, we are all here to support you during your journey, whether it's tomorrow, two years or 10 years from now, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead with the questions. Um, that's fine. So one of the questions from the audience was actually getting access to the slides. So I, I think the presentations are all recorded, right? And so people can get access to all the slides. When will it be available? Um, we should have it done in a few, few days, a week, by most. Okay. And then you'll have, it, uh, you'll have a link on your site. Does that have a... Since the, we have people live, I want to make sure everyone hears us. So we do record all of our events 
this particular event, I don't want to speak for Eric, who's our IT person, um, but what we do is we try to, within a week, we take all of the presentations, um, separate them into separate videos. If you have registered for this event, regardless of whether you're in person or watching live stream, if you are registered via live stream, you will get an email in your inbox um, in which you will actually get the videos, a list. They always appear afterwards on our website, on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can always email us um, to Ann Taylor, who's our Director of Community Engagement. She's on the Contact Us page. If you go on our website, there's a little chat function that pops up and you can ask for them there. We may try to make it really easy for you to get them. Yeah. So I think we're gonna ask our um, panelists to come up to the stage if they don't mind, have a seat up here so we can ask the questions. You guys okay with that? Hopefully there's enough to say it. chairs. Okay, well, we don't have a standing or Anyway, thank, thank you guys for all staying. All right, so we're going to um, kind of go in some order. Uh, the first question is for um, anybody, but particularly Ashley, is uh, the concept of eating sugar and cancer. Can you comment about that? I think we have the mic here. Oh, you got one. Hello. Uh, yeah, so sugar and cancer is a big, big question with a lot of cancer patients um, and survivors. Um, there's two, always two types of sugar that we talk about. So there's added sugar, right, or refined sugar that's coming from sweets or um, any type of sugar that's added, right, to a product. Um, these have been shown to have no nutritive effect in your body and then also cause more inflammation. And so generally we recommend reducing added sugars in your body. Um, in terms of natural sugars, which is the other type of sugar, these are found in fruits, carbohydrates, any, any carbohydrates. So it could be in whole grains, it could be in fruits, uh, starchy vegetables. Um, and so while these sugars are processed in the body the same, they also are providing your vitamin C, your vitamin um, A, right? So they, your fiber. And so they have a lot more benefits um, to them um, uh, compared to the added sugars, right? So another part, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is your body needs um, carbohydrates, it needs natural sugars in order to have energy. That's where most of our energy come from. And so especially if you are a cancer survivor or undergoing therapy, there's no need to limit your amount of natural sugar um, because you do need that energy. Cancer patients have actually an increase um, of estimated calorie needs. And, um, and so there's no there's no need to limit that. In terms of added sugars, refined grains, um, that is generally shown to have more inflammation in the body. And so reducing that in your diet can be beneficial. Hope I answered that question. Oh, so yeah, we'll yeah. actually, actually th this next one um, is sort of connected. Um, and I think actually that you might have mentioned something very peripheral to this, but I don't know if you want to stab, take a stab at um, the role of microbes or the, or I guess the, um, the, the gut microbiome, we call it, to improving the ability to respond to therapy. Yes. So, um... For all cancer, I, I think for all microbiome and um, uh, just general gut bacteria research, it's still um, ongoing, right? Um, there's a lot of research um, and a lot of missing pieces as well, uh, but maintaining a healthy gut at any stage of your life is beneficial, um, specifically for cancer patients too, because a lot of these, as we heard in a lot of the presentations, a lot of these um, Treatment, immunotherapy, chemo, radiation, um, 
decrease your immune function. And part of your immune, a big part of your immune function comes from your gut, right? So um, definitely I would say in terms of gut bacteria, right? Like maintaining healthy gut bacteria, whether you're a healthy individual, a cancer survivor or cancer patient, just make sure you're eating adequate fiber, um, ad having adequate um, antioxidants, right? Um, and this is where the fruits and vegetables come in. You're choosing whole grains over refined grains, um, legumes, beans, nuts, and seeds, which also carry your omega-3s. Um, yes, so that's nice. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I, I'm gonna also uh, try to uh, expand on that just a bit. Um, the field of the gut microbiome and now even uh, other, other microbiomes that our bodies carry uh, is under very uh, intense research, and some of the um, while while the experts figure that part out, some of the clinical and somewhat empiric things that have that have um, emerged include the fact that, and this is specific to melanoma, but it's probably also true for other malignancies that patients who get courses of antibiotics at any time during the you know the interval when they're looking at their um, at immunotherapy. Uh, perioperative, et cetera, uh, tend to do worse, you know, with statistical significance than those who did not. You know, you might say, well, those patients had infections. Naturally, they, you know, they're they're worse candidates. But all those things were sort of corrected for. Um, uh, and the um, the other thing that has not been, it's been sort of disappointing, has been the idea that you could restore the gut microbiome uh, if you happen to run into a course of antibiotics by giving things like macrobiotic uh, you know, diets and, and supplements and, and so forth. Um, and it so far hasn't proven um, to be useful. Now, we do know that something a little bit more gross, which is to package um, the some sort of semi-purified fecal material from individuals who went into remission on immunotherapy and then have it delivered to those, you know, in the in the um, oral, uh, you know, I think the pills are like in something you wouldn't never taste it, but you swallow. And um, you can, re again, a, a way to restore the microbiome of the gut with uh, the species that are associated with a favorable outcome has been done based on animal studies and looks pretty good. So if you ever see that term FMT, it's fecal micro, uh, microbial uh, transplant, I, I think something like that. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, the next question is uh, for the dermatologists. Uh, the question about sunscreens, do you have any particular uh, brands, you talked about uh, physical sunscreens. Um, is there an age limit, uh, uh, say on babies? Could you put sunscreen on babies? Uh, how often can you reapply it? Is there any toxicity uh, related to putting on sunscreens in relationship to any medicines that can counter the effects or cause increased uh, side effects? Okay. I'll start in the middle. On to you. So, in terms of the specific brands, I'm actually a convenience snob, but not a brand snob. If you find something you like that it's the price point you like, and somewhere on those active ingredients it says zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, and it's an SPF 30 or more, it's more than fine. Um, you know, common ones that are easy to find, of course, are like Neutrogena and Avino, but I, I really am not particular about brands, and I really emphasize that with my patients because when you get wedded to a brand, sometimes you're not using the best, you know, the best product for you. Uh, generally, I recommend sunscreens in babies six months and older because younger than that, their skin barrier isn't really fully formed. And even though I am a huge advocate, as you heard of the physical mineral sunscreens that sit on top of the skin, I think the less irritants on baby skin, probably the better. And um, in terms of what you can mix with sunscreens, that's one of the other reasons I like physical block sunscreens is that they tend to play well with others. Um, when you have different chemical ingredients and then you're using uh, other products sometimes, especially therapeutic products, you can, can cause interactions. I think in general products that you should limit if you are very conscious of your sun exposure are things like alpha hydroxy acids and retinoids while you're out in the sun. Um, they don't layer well with sunscreens and they actually sensitize you to ultraviolet. So if you are using an alpha hydroxy product or a retinoid and you are using that for other reasons for exfoliation or cell turnover, try to use it at night and then wash it off in the morning. Um, 
Do you want to explain? Yeah. Sure. No, I totally agree with you. Um, but I do want to say that a lot of times, even though I say it's not about the brands, then patients still want me to give recommendations. So I do have some recommendations for good and affordable physical sunblockers. So those are the titanium and zinc sunblockers. Um, so for example, Blue Lizard is a very good, solid, reputable brand um, that has a physical sunblocks that has no fragrance, minimal preservatives. So which are really good for people with sensitive skin, especially if you're going through immunotherapy, having dermatitis, having acne. So choosing a fragrance-free uh, sunscreen can be really beneficial and also like oil-free sunscreen. But then additionally, I tell my patients, sunscreen is not bulletproof. I actually personally prefer UV clothing and big hats, much more reliable than sunscreen. Because sunscreen, you need to reapply often. I say every one to two hours if you're going to be out, but if you're going to be out that long, sunscreen is not going to protect you. So sunscreen plus UV shirt plus a broad rim hat. Uh, and then lastly, if a sunscreen stings your skin, don't use that sunscreen. So if it doesn't feel good, don't use it. Could I, just, could I just ask, I know you don't want to do brands, but over the last, over some years, Susan Sweater suggested something that she said, I think it was a UVA thing that she said, you could only get in Canada. And do you guys, are you guys familiar? Yeah, she, yeah, she, so, so actually Susan Sweater, I trained at Stanford. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that Susan, was uh, McSorrel at the time, which was uh, a, a UVA chemical block ingredient. And then it is now available in the okay. United States. Um, and, if you are going to stick with a chemical block ingredient, one that is a broad spectrum UVA block is appropriate. And that, that was an ingredient that, that did augment the, the protection. Um, since this is sort of a, a melanoma focused audience, I, it's still not my favorite choice uh, because I'm just such a big advocate of the mineral physical screens. Yeah, thank you. Okay, can oh, I just it's... jump in for a second? Because yeah, a lot yes, of questions yeah. about I, sunscreen. I can't see. Oh, um, we're just we having to start with those. We've got plenty of others. Well, go, go well, ahead, so. well, no, no, no. But I was going to say, because I know there's lots of questions. Yeah. So we actually have something called State of the Sunscreen in the U.S. It's very, um, it's like 20 pages. If people are interested, they can reach out and we can just email you that, that pack yeah. little booklet. Okay. That's great. Are people on the virtuals uh, able to hear you? Is that, oh, we're talking to everybody then. Okay, good. Oh, is it my turn? Okay. Um, so this, I guess, should be going to Patty, uh, who I think addressed this, but if you want to take a shot at a, a, another way to answer it, were all side effects temporary after immunotherapy? That's all it says. <laughs> do, do you want to like address which ones tend to be permanent and just to reiterate like the endocrine things and stuff? Yes, I know. I think we had to kind of speed through some of those um, side effects quickly because of the time constraints. But uh, I believe that I mentioned some of the side effects like vitiligo, the change in the pigment of the skin tends to be permanent. The thyroid disorders tend to be permanent and the cortisol uh, disorders tend to be permanent requiring medication for life. Um, anything I missed, do you think, Dr. Marco? Um, maybe arthralgias, maybe the joint, maybe the joint pains, which tend to be not exclusively, but I would say somewhat more often in patients who had already some arthritis or a tendency towards that. Um, I would venture to say that as we move away from ipilimumab or Yervoy, that some of those, uh, permanent endocrine effects are going to be absent because they seem to be rather specific to that. Um, although, you know, it's going to take some time to, to get all those data together. Sam. Oh, okay. I guess it's your turn. Yeah. There's a, a genetics question. It's, I think uh, Miles kind of briefly went over is who should be tested. And then the second part of this question is, is there any relationship with prostate cancer and melanoma? Yeah, so um, who should be tested? Uh, there's a whole you know, range of, of guidelines that suggest who should be tested and who should get a genetic counseling visit. Um, it's all in the slides, but basically, you know, to reiterate, anyone with three or more melanomas, if one was diagnosed under the age of 45, anyone with 50 or more melanocytic nevi and a family history of melanoma, and there were some other 
Um, so there are some other criteria as well. Anyone with a personal or family history of triple negative breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, um, prostate cancer and melanoma can be linked by the BRCA2 mutation, for example. BRCA2 does increase someone's risk for prostate cancer as well as for melanoma. So it's possible that if someone has had two primaries, like a melanoma and a prostate cancer, that maybe there is a germline BRCA2 mutation that caused both of those primary cancers. So they can be related, yeah. Thank you, Miles. Um, okay, I like this one, uh, maybe because it goes to me. Um, <laughs> but no, but I think it's actually something I didn't talk about. Again, trying to save uh, a little time, but that's okay. The idea is that this, that's what this period is for. So the, the questioner asks, what factors are present for you to recommend immunotherapy for stage two melanoma? So you may recall that I showed you, and we've kind of focused on the, um, the data for stage three melanoma. I showed you the three slides. One was, at, one was nivolumab versus ipilimumab. Uh, one was um, pembrolizumab versus nothing. And the third one was the use of the combined uh, BRAF uh, targeted therapies. And then on the next slide were, were the two graphs. One was progression or relapse-free survival and the other one was overall survival. And they showed a much more modest difference between the two curves using uh, those same drugs versus, versus nothing or versus placebo for stage two melanoma. Two points there were that the difference between the curves was much less. So the degree of benefit is much less than for the higher risk uh, uh, stage. And the other is that even those patients who didn't get the, the treatment did uh, better than people with stage three disease because they had stage two disease. And we could go into lots of details about, I, I mentioned that some people with certain types of stage two disease do a little worse than some patients with certain types of stage three disease. So the, those staging curves actually cross each other. But to now answer the, the, the question, the factors that we tend to use to decide uh, when to give a stage two patient adjuvant therapy, and it's only gonna be stage two B and stage two C, um, uh, are the, the depth or the Breslow thickness of the melanoma. The, the, the further down it goes below the granular layer, the higher uh, the, the risk is for recurrence. But the most important thing is the presence of ulceration. So when the skin over the melanoma is, um, is uh, split apart and there's a discontinuous coating over that um, melanoma, that is associated with an ability of that melanoma to come back and possibly even more specifically associated with its ability to spread through blood vessels rather than lymphatic vessels. And that spread through blood vessels is a, a, a worse um, uh, behavior than the ones that go through lymphatic vessels. So those are the, those are the criteria that I, that I would use um, and that, that I am using for the most part. I don't know, do you wanna add to that, Trevin? Do you wanna add? anything from the surgical point of view? Okay. I think the only point is it's, it's an evolving science in of itself because the study suggested there's a benefit, but it's not really clear which patients benefit. And it's not really clear if you waited and just treated these patients down the road, if something happened, it, would the outcome be the same? So I think that's under investigation still. So our, our next question, I think is back to the dermatologist is um, with the increasing incidence of melanoma, both in Caucasians and non-white uh, people, uh, can we explain it all by the change in um, the ozone layer? And somebody even made the point, should they actually move from Santa Monica to Alaska to avoid, <laughs> to avoid UV exposure? So do you ladies have any comments? <laughs> Um, I definitely think. <laughs> <laughs> I think a smart move up north. Um, but no, joking aside, uh, for sure there are tons of uh, large uh, migration study where people were followed from uh, after moving from a native uh, location to either a sunny location or less sunny location, showing that move, the migration changed their melanoma risk factor. 
our uh, risk, uh, like uh, in, like overall risk for melanoma. So that has been documented. So we know that living closer to equator will give you a higher risk, regardless of your skin type, regardless of your race, ethnicity, just by the fact that you're living in an environment, you have higher year round uh, UV index radiation. And going back to the continuous increasing melanoma instance, I sure agree that there's definitely a contribution globally from pollution, decreasing ozone protection, but also there is a school of experts thinking that uh, suggests that we're just better at diagnosing or better at reporting. So that's definitely a possible contribution, but interestingly, the rise in melanoma in non-Caucasian patients have actually been shown to concentrate in thicker tumors. So it's not just better at detecting melanoma, catching them early, but it's also potentially other environmental risk factors. We know that pollution and pesticides are risk factors as well. So that could also be a contributing factor to seeing more melanomas in uh, the recent years. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think the only other thing, in addition to just pollution and environmental factors, is habits, right? Like I was alluding to how we spend our leisure time. Um, even things like aqual indigenous melanoma, which are the under the nail melanoma that my colleague so eloquently showed you, or beautiful photo and, and description, we think some of the things we do, like constant gel nails and products that we come in contact with that that repetitive inflammatory process may contribute to some of these melanoma that are not in sun exposed areas is one hypothesis for sure um, but I think you know going back to whether you should move to Alaska we all live here in Santa Monica because we love it right I love the sun so like it's it's not that the sun is the enemy and so I can't hearken back enough to the message that it's not where you live it's how you protect yourself and that's something you can control. Right, so we're talking about sunscreens, but like she said, sun protective clothing, wearing your hats, scheduling your leisure activities, because I love to play golf, I love to play tennis, but I just do it early in the morning or late in the evening. So if you can schedule your life a little bit, then you don't have to live in fear and you don't have to move. You just want to learn how to prevent those burns and those times you're out to the point that you turn red and then you can very gracefully protect yourself and still enjoy your life. So sorry to your husband, yeah. with due respect, he's the real estate <laughs> person. Okay, Your my turn. next, yeah. Okay, so this this is a little technical, but please mention the S1801 neoadjuvant study. Um, so the S1801, somebody either online or in the audience uh, is familiar with um, an about to be published uh, paper that was, um, that was reported at the ESMO meeting, uh, the European Society for Medical Oncology a month ago uh, by Dr. Sabna Patel at um, MD Anderson and a whole lot of her colleagues, including um, nicely uh, myself. I'm a deep middle author, which means uh, if you know anything about uh, academics, it means you probably didn't really do much. You put a few patients on the study and you, you edited the manuscript a little bit, but that showed there was a very, very, straightforward, the most simple and well-designed thing you could imagine, because what it was was to um, have patients with what I described earlier as um, uh, a resectable but not but but large mass of melanoma in a single site that um, uh, in a patient who could was presumed to be able to tolerate immune checkpoint blockade. And the commonest one that's given in the um, adjuvant post-operative setting is pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And so in this study, simply uh, around 350 patients were randomized between getting uh, three cycles of pembrolizumab three weeks apart prior to surgery, and then another 15 cycles after surgery to total one full year of every three week treatment versus the other half of patients being randomized to get their surgery first, which has been traditional, and then after that get their 18 cycles of pembrolizumab, exactly the same dose, et cetera, uh, out to the one-year mark as well. So everyone got all the same things done, but they did it with a very slightly different um, uh, sequence. And then, of course, there's a whole lot of the laboratory um, assays, uh, such as what I told you earlier, you can get tissue before treatment and then after at the time of surgery, et cetera. And the, um, the curves, I'm sorry, I didn't put them in my uh, presentation. It's brand new data, but the curves showed 
uh, a definite uh, split in the um, in the two curves of relapse-free survival. So, um, and everybody who was supposed to get surgery got surgery with the exception of one patient who refused, but this meant they did surgery even on those patients who had what appeared to be a complete remission and their physical exam became normal and their PET scan became negative and there was just no sign whatsoever of tumor, but they cut out the nodes that had been previously involved to their best ability and showed that there was a, a high rate of complete uh, um, pathologic remission where they, you didn't see any melanoma in there. And even when there was still a lump, a lot of the time, the lump didn't have any melanoma cells. All it had was uh, these kind of scar, uh, what we call fibrosis or you know chronic inflammatory cells, but no melanoma or melanophages, which are uh, these um, cells that pick up the melanin, the, the pigment, but the mel melanoma cells are dead. And those melanophages, uh, phage means eat, um, they're just there, just cleaning up the, you know, the debris. So keep uh, uh, one of the big um, international uh, experts in surgical oncology who does melanoma named uh, Lex Egermont. Uh, I, I heard the statement in the audience and it's been sort of heavily publicized that he said, said to the, to the, to the um, you know, he's talking to the surgeons in the audience and saying, don't go to the directly to the OR anymore. Call your medical your medical oncologist and tell them tell them all right now that they need to treat the patients first, and then you're going to do surgery or not. And so um, uh, that's that's what's going around. Your turn. Okay. So the next question is about um, the latest technology in dermatology, including uh, confocal microscopy, and so. Um, can you guys comment about that? And also personally, the apps that are available for patients. What are your, what are your thoughts about apps for uh, detecting melanoma or skin cancer at all? Um, oh, oh yeah, this is on. So for confocal microscopy, the availability is really limited to major skin cancer centers um, because the machine is not cheap. It requires special training. Um, but interesting, it is paid by insurance. There's a CPT code uh, under Medicare uh, that we can bill because it's really literally like, as I've shown you, reading uh, uh, imaging of the skin. So it's like a pathology or histology code. Um, it's not something that will, um, I would say, absolutely change your life for most melanoma patients. Uh, if you just have one or two primary melanomas, you don't have the familial dysplastic neva syndrome, or you have over, meaning that you have a lot of atypical moles, I think a routine skin check with dermatologists is sufficient. Um, but if you have multiple dysplastic nevi, you have a strong family and person who has multiple primary melanomas, confocal for sure can minimize unnecessary biopsy and also help uh, your dermatologist to catch what we call featureless melanomas. So those are melanomas that look like nothing. They're like maybe a little brown dot. They have regular edges. They don't have multiple colors. They are flat. So the featureless melanoma, as well as the pink moles, which is the scariest of all, uh, we are dermatologists are really afraid of pink moles because pink or nodular melanomas are much more difficult to diagnose by visual or demoscopy. So this is where confocal microscopy really come in handy, it, uh, augments significantly our diagnostic accuracy. Um, for sure, it can improve outcome in the selected population of high-risk melanoma patients. Um, and then moving on to apps, I'm not a personal fan of apps, but uh, I'm going to say it's, we, we need to move with the times. We can't just like resist the change. I think as technologies, AI, machine vision are definitely uh, sort of the future of medicine. Um, it, it's limited because the diagnostic accuracy is not proven and it has not been proven to change melanoma outcome. Um, but if you use the app wisely and in conjunction, uh, have a good relationship with your dermatologist, that can be beneficial. It may minimize uh, your anxiety about spots, but it does not replace uh, 
is seeing a dermatologist, getting a full body skin check and getting a, a suspicious most removed and biopsied. So that's where I'm at. Uh, oh, there's one more thing. There's a tape strip technique where uh, if um, you have a mole that you don't want to have biopsy, Comfoco is not available. There is a kit your dermatologist can get. It's like literally like a sticky tape. Uh, it, you apply the tape to those suspicious mole and then and you should take off the tape. Supposedly it catches uh, uh, superficial skin cells and then that can detect mutation that can correlate with melanoma. Again, that has been around for the past few years. It has not taken off just because again, it does not replace biopsy. Yeah, and, and I would agree. So the two kind of uh, outside of the university center, other than um, the confocal microscopy, which I think is fantastic. If you're in a clinic, one of the things she was referring to, um, the tape stripping is called derm tech. And the idea is that if there is a concerning mole and you show it to your dermatologist, it can be tape stripped and sent for genetic analysis and high risk melanoma gene mutations can be identified. But I think we heard from Miles that not every mutation is one we know of. And so there are, uh, you know, these familial, but not necessarily specific mutations. And so in my clinic, we did, we're big tech oriented clinic. So we adopted it quite early about five years ago, but we did our own analysis where if the derm tech um, came back as low risk, but we clinically were still concerned about them. Well, we actually biopsied it and we found a, a fair number of sadly concerning spots were missed because we don't yet have accurate tape stripping genetic testing. So I think with tech, it's excellent to push the envelope and to try to adopt uh, you know, any new advancement, because obviously everybody's end goal is to improve survival and outcomes in melanoma. But I completely agree with my colleague, it cannot replace the trained eye of an expert. So please do still establish that relationship with your dermatologist. Um, and then I completely agree about the apps. I think it's a great thing that, because I have a lot of apps on my phone that just remember, remind me to do stuff, right? Like that's, that's the hard thing in life is we're also busy and we don't remember. And so one really nice thing about apps is they're probably going to trigger you uh, with a reminder to check yourself. And then if there is something that you're concerned about vis-a-vis -a, -vis a mole, it's a great way if you have those pictures stored to go into your dermatologist and say, oh, look, I had this picture of the mole and it's changed. And the app will flag that or show you a new mole that just comes out of the blue. And so I think those are useful, but I think while it's a helpful adjunct, it's not a replacement. Just while you were answering that, I was thinking about some of those uh, screening fairs that people have in various places and thinking that to, to increase the level of accuracy of the app above what a, a patient or a prospective patient might use, as well as the derm tech, to incorporate those two methods for quick and large volume screenings in these screening fairs, and then triage the ones that have suspicious uh, findings you know, to the dermatologist. I don't know if anybody's doing that. Um, I forgot who is it. Me next? I'm next. Okay. So, uh, what are examples? What are examples of directed therapy? There's not. Um, <clears throat> there's like a, a an asterisk here, and I don't know. But I'm going to assume the question is: What are examples of targeted therapy? <clears throat> and just ask that. Answer that. And we still have a fair amount of questions. So, uh, examples of targeted therapy. And remember, I said earlier, really the only good tar uh, molecular target we have in melanoma is the BRF. Um, V600 uh, mutation, usually it's a V600E, I think it's valine to glutamic acid or something like that. And then, then there's one with a, a V to K, a V to D, V to R, I think those are less common and somewhat less sensitive. The drug groups are a combination of an inhibitor of the BRAF pathway, of the BRAF protein, the mutated one, and a second one that's an inhibitor of a non-mutated protein that's downstream, it's the next chemical step down from, um, from BRAF, and that combination is better and safer than just BRAF inhibition. The three examples of the, of the pairs that we have are um, vemurafenib, also known as Zelberaf, with um, cobimetinib, also known as Cotelic, dobrafenib, also known as Tafinlar, and trametinib, also known as mechanist, and then encorafenib, known as, um, help me here, encorafenib, 
Oh, oh, okay. uh, Bref Toby and uh, and uh, Binny Metnib, also known as Mech Toby. So three pairs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll, we'll stop right there. Okay. So uh, the, the next question is about follow up and maybe um, Dr. Fluke and then the derm. So uh, somebody wrote a question about have they had early stage melanoma? And so why do they need follow up? Mm -hmm. Uh, so when you're a patient who we take to the operating room and remove um, an early stage melanoma or and any melanoma, we want to surveil you. We see you back because you could have a recurrence. So we want to look at your incision and uh, make sure that you don't develop any pigment within the incision. That's something that concerns us for recurrence. We also look around the incision to see if there are any other concerning moles. Um, melanoma is a, a tricky cancer because sometimes it, you can develop melanomas, we call them in transient lesions. So they go from where that primary mole was toward the, the lymphatic drainage site. And those are essentially additional melanomas in the skin. So those are things that we look for. We also examine the, the lymph nodes or nodal basin from uh, in the area that the melanoma could go to. So those are all things that we're doing when we surveil you. For early stage melanoma, so stage zero, we normally see people uh, once a year. Yeah, right? Once a year. Yeah, once a year. And uh, for you know, more advanced melanomas, right? Or the non-stage zero melanomas, we'll see you every six months for two years and then yearly for three years and then uh, or yearly really after that uh, until 10 years and then you get to graduate and we see you once every other year. Laura, do, do you mind men mentioning also um, the uh, ultrasound surveillance of the lymph node bed in patients with a, a single or limited number of sentinel nodes that in lieu of what we used to do. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if you could. Uh, yeah. Um, so in patients that had a melanoma that was thick enough that we uh, needed to evaluate lymph nodes for, when we get those lymph nodes back, if there is no cancer in them, then we just follow you with physical exams, right? An exam with a practiced hand. Um, to evaluate, to make sure that you don't develop uh, any enlargement of the lymph nodes. Now, if you were to, if there were to be some cancer cells in those lymph nodes, but it's a very small, just few cells or a very small area, instead of historically, we would take you back to the operating room and remove all of those lymph nodes. And that's when it was more commonly seen people would get that lymphedema. So, uh, there have been a bunch of studies and now we no longer do that. Uh, instead, we perform ultrasounds of that lymph node basin so that we can surveil the lymph nodes in the area. And then of course, in addition to our follow-up, we ask patients to see their dermatologists so that they can have a full skin exam um, as well. Do you guys have any comments? Mm -hmm. I would say simply put, the reason for follow-up is your tumor can come back and you can get a new one. Remember having that first melanoma, you are at an elevated risk for another one. So I completely agree with what Dr. Fluke was saying about the windows of follow-up. But, you know, you bought yourself some surveillance, unfortunately, with that first cancer diagnosis. We just want to keep an eye on you and make sure nothing new comes back, uh, nothing new comes up or nothing comes back. No, nothing to add. Totally agree. It's really for uh, surveillance of secondary tumors to secondary melanoma, non-melanoma skin cancers. And I'll just top that off with what I, I'm so glad the question did not come up about how often do you scan and what scans do you use? Because I spent a lot of time in the exam room trying to explain to patients that there's not any real proven type of scan or sequence that is the right one and that everything else is the wrong one. Um, there are some people who have, you know, standard things that they do. Uh, they have more volume of patients than I do. I, I kind of wing it, but, but um, the, the fact is that both these physical exams and the ultrasound sometimes, which are local things, and the, um, and the occasional scans, depending on the stage that the patient started with, are components of finding either new, uh, you know, new metastases or uh, in the case of new primaries, it's, it's really the physical exam. So my turn, your turn. 
I guess my turn. Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is, I think it's been mentioned in parts about diet, any diets that will help with treatment? And is there any diets that help um, prevent you from getting side effects? Of, I think immunotherapy is, is the concept. Uh, so for cancer in general, and I guess specifically melanoma as well, there's no current, there's no specific diet we recommend. We generally just recommend a healthy um, general diet. And so that includes, um, you know, lean proteins, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, healthy fats. Um, in terms of the treatment, so while you're go undergoing treatment, and it's funny because a lot of the a lot of the um, nutrition counseling we do at the hospital is more just symptom based, right? It's more side effects that come with the, the treatments. Um, and so whether it's nausea or diarrhea, um, loss of appetite, um, even for, um, you know, head and neck cancers, um, they could be like mouth sores, right? So it's it's different for everyone. There's there's things that we counsel on. Um, there's no specific diet that prevents you from having side effects. Um, it's more just um, the treatments are kind of you know hitting at your immune system, and so um, and everyone is different. And so one person might have no side effects. One person might have just nausea, or they might have the tr a trio, right? So it just depends on the person. Um, and so, yes, there's general healthy diet and there's no specific, um, diet that will prevent, um, side effects. Oh, Patty, any comments? Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, Patty, do you want to do chime in on that at all? Or are you in agreement? I would just like to say that being an oncology nurse for 40 years, I, I agree with that completely. Um, you know, seeing patients experience those symptoms and um, become malnourished because they're not getting the nutrition that they need is one of the reasons why the dietitians are so important in the care of the cancer patients. So thank you for the work that you do. In my fellowship, the guiding principle was the MIP regimen, morphine, ice cream, and prednisone. But, <laughs> but in immunotherapy, we, we bag the prednisone if we can. Um, okay, please. So this will be a little bit me and a little bit um, the dermatologists. Please talk about vitiligo, uh, vitiligo side effect of Optiva, et cetera. Why does it happen? Is it associated with a better prognosis? And is there any treatment? Um, mine will be quick. Uh, there is, there is a, a trend towards better outcomes with the development of vitiligo as well as other immune related side effects. Um, there's remarkably little more known about the impact and mechanism of that association for vitiligo over any of the other remarkably um, organ systems such as colon. Um, so, uh, so I'm not gonna belabor that and I'll turn it over to you too if you wanna um, uh, chime in. Sure, just so for those who don't know, vitiligo is an autoimmune attack on your pigment cells. So uh, we saw a photo of it where you see these white depigmented patches on the skin. And so the hypothesis is that when you're taking immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, you're taking the brakes off your immune system. Your immune system is going into overdrive and you're harnessing that to kill the melanoma tumor cells. But inadvertently, obviously, you do have regular pigment cells in your skin, your melanocytes that are meant to be there. And so unfortunately, you can have your immune system start to target those normal pigment cells, and then you get these white dropped out areas where there is no pigment. And cosmetically, that can be really problematic for patients, especially in areas like this, where you have a lot of skin of color. And uh, as much as we've tried to normalize self-esteem with pigmentary disorders, it's, it's pretty devastating when you don't look or feel your best and you feel embarrassed to go out because now you have patchy white pat, you know, spots on your skin. Um, I will say that one nice development uh, with the LIGO therapy is we now have new topicals that have very recently been approved that are anti-inflammatories rather than steroids, as well as steroids topically, that can at least where the immune system is attacking the pigment cells where you want it in the surface of the skin can help disperse that inflammation and help some of the pigment recover. So it's not hopeless now as it used to be even 10 years ago with the LIGO. So that's if you are experiencing vitiligo as a side effect from immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, do know that we have great tools for it. 
Um, and that's totally agree. But I, I tend not to treat melaligo in my okay. melanoma patients. Um, I actually, turns out a lot of my melanoma patients, they don't mind having the melaligo patches because, <laughs> right. And um, in addition to having the depigmented white patches, your moles can change too. You can have halo nevi. That can be concerning because a lot of times we don't know if the halo nevi is from a side effect of uh, uh, expected villiligo around the nevus or the mole, or is it something else going on? So we, that's when we need to be uh, very careful about examining all the moles. Thank you. Oh, You're next. A question for Patty is, uh, what is the importance of the uh, research nurses in melanoma studies? Can you make a quick comment about that? <laughs> well, I, I can just say that I did an excellent answer job with all my patients, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the most important thing for research nurses caring for patients on melanoma clinical trials is making sure that they are educated in what to report. They are aware of their visit schedule and their testing schedule and um, making sure that they understand the medications that they are, are prescribed and they're taking them as directed. Um, I think that we, I always used to visit in the clinic whenever the patients came in because it was part of my job to report on any of the side effects as well. So I think that's really important in managing the patients through this treatment. I'll just, add, I have to add to that. I mean, the importance of the research nurse in melanoma is top, top, top. And um, as a person who has lost her nurse practitioner due to some moving around the country issues and not enough patients to justify it, according to the uh, bean counters, um, not having a nurse that the patients can call, whether it's a research nurse if the patient's on a trial or whether it's a non-research nurse if the patient isn't on a trial, it's there's something missing. So, you know, it's possible to move through the world without a, a, a nurse by one side, research non, but it's really much nicer for the patient and the doctor to have that extra person who cares and who just goes the extra mile. Um, question for the, I guess this is the derms and for Ashley about the vitamin D recommendations. Um, you know, how much vitamin D should you take orally? And then what about how much sun exposure do you actually need to uh, get your vitamin D requirement? The vitamin D recommendation uh, varies by age, but it's basically 200 to 600 IU uh, per day is kind of the amount we typically uh, want people to have. And in terms of supplements, uh, there's a met a physician at BU who's done a lot of research actually on vitamin D and its role in metabolism and is a big advocate of if you are going to supplement with a pill, taking a thousand unit, international units a day or 5,000 a week. And the idea though, in terms of sun exposure, as I think I said very briefly at the beginning of my presentation is that if you get five to 10 minutes of ultraviolet light here at a place near the equator, um, three times a week, your skin also should be synthesizing enough to get to those international units I'm mentioning. Ashley also very appropriately mentioned dietary sources. So I tell everyone, egg yolks, fatty fish, salmon, mackerel, I mean, they're good for you anyway. They have a lot of really good omega fatty acids regardless. Um, fortified milk is a great source of vitamin D as is juice. But it's not hard to get to those numbers that we know are sufficient to put you in better risk categories across the board in terms of vitamin D. And uh, again, I, I spent a lot of time here in Santa Monica counseling my patients that you can certainly get adequate vitamin D without being out to the point that you turn pink and burn. And so I'll tell people, sure, go out, sit on your patio, get some sunlight for five or 10 minutes, and then go inside and put your hat on and your sunscreen and live, you know, go out and live your life. Um, I don't know if I, either of my colleagues want to ask. <laughs> so I, I'm more like a, a purist. Um, I actually did some research on vitamin D and melanoma. It turns out this whole concept of you have to get sunlight to get vitamin D is not necessarily accurate because a lot of data have shown that our skin's ability to convert vitamin D from sunlight declines sharply as we age. 
but our GI's absorption rate stays stable. This is why you actually get a much more reliable vitamin D source when you take it, whether it's food or supplement. And then also interesting, there are so many studies that have been published looking at people living in sunny states. In Florida, there's actually a California study and another one in Hawaii of people who are outdoor farm workers so those are people who are outside more than five to 10 minutes a day. Uh, they're chronically exposed year round sun. They are vitamin D deficient. And people also have studied uh, a population or genetics uh, mutation called zero derma pigmentosis. So this is a rare disease where you're born with uh, certain mutations that you're predisposed to numerous cancers, particularly skin cancer. So those population patients uh, very rare. They have been taught to stay away from the sun ever since childhood, and they have been evaluated. They don't have vitamin D deficiency. So vi this, this I personally think vitamin D is a very important marker, um, biomarker for a lot of health outcomes, cardiovascular, diabetes, and melanoma, but it is much safer to eat and take a vitamin D than say putting your skin at risk. <laughs> Um, but I do agree with like a thousand international units. I, just because we see a lot of people in Miami about, oh, like, why should I need to get some sun for vitamin D? I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm gonna, I can take these three and turn them into one. Do you have any comments? Um, I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say, um, I definitely agree. I think it's um, also when we talk about diet and supplementation, a lot of the times we, um, are attracted to supplements because they're easier to take. Um, but a lot of those supplements contain over the recommendation of what we, what we need. Right. And so getting it through diet alone or through whether it's diet alone or a uh, safe sun exposure. Um, I also think that, um, getting it from, uh, mostly your diet, right. Or, um, I was going to say, I lost my train of thought. Um, so mostly diet, um, but I also think that in terms of there's other there's other uh, comor comorbidities that kind of decrease your absorption of vitamin D. We've seen a lot of vitamin D deficiencies after COVID, especially because people were going out less, um, but also either uh, gaining weight or um, maybe having more uh, occurrences of you know diabetes or um, you know heart disease, etc. Um, and so. Yes, in general, it is for general um, general prevention, right? Um, but I always, always, dietitians and then also American Cancer Society is always more of a proponent getting it from diet versus supplements. Thank you. I have, what you're done? Oh, okay. So I have I have three questions, but there I'm going to merge them all into one, and then I'm just going to take the privilege of asking one quick question to the dermatologist. Uh, the three questions that I'm merging are: When do you use T cell therapy? Is it widely used yet? And what are the side effects? This other one says F cell therapy. I think it means T cell therapy. How prevalent? Seems personalized. Cost factor. And then the third one is: What are the most hopeful treatments and/or research developments that will impact care in 23 and beyond? So I'll, I'll just put in, I'll, I'll use those as, a, as an excuse to reveal my particular bias, which is coming now to merge with, um, with reality, which is the uh, advent of effector T cell therapy. So I, I gave you a very quick slide. I didn't really want to take the extra time to talk about it, but uh, it's actually been going on since 1985 or so in the surgery branch at the National Cancer Institute, where uh, Steve Rosenberg and his many, many, many trainees over the years have been pioneering and fine tuning the art of taking a tumor. Uh, and, and mostly they've done melanoma, but it can be done with other tumors um, and removing it. Uh, cutting it up and placing it into um, a, a, a vial or a, a flask of medium that is nutritional, like it's like a fortified broth um, to which has been added growth factors that stimulate the growth of the T cells, but they do not help the tumor grow. And over time, the tumor kind of dies out and the T cells become expanded and they can separate them out with centrifuges, uh, et cetera. And then 
They sometimes put them in the freezer for a while if the patient is doing pretty well with something else. And when the patient needs the treatment, they thaw the cells, they grow them for another couple of weeks in the, in the medium, and then give the cells back to the patient. In order to make the cells grow even better inside the patient, it turns out you have to give the patient uh, a couple of types of chemotherapy, chemotherapy that doesn't do anything to the growth of their melanoma, but it will uh, lower their blood counts in such a way that the incoming cells get a burst of, of uh, energy inside the body, some growth factors that the body makes. And the ultimate result is you get a lot of those T cells that were, that were um, expanded in the, in the laboratory. Um, the idea there and the, and the results are that are around 40% of those patients have had a very good remission in response to the, to what is their own T cells. They haven't been genetically engineered. They haven't, um, the only thing you give after the T cells is a few doses of this T cell growth factor called interleukin-2. Uh, you give it at doses um, and durations that are not as devastating as they used to be when we used to use it by itself um, before we got the, the better drugs we have now. And that form of therapy is now, um, has now been filed with the FDA from one of the two major companies in the US that are working on it. And then there's a, a lot of other labs that are working on different ways to fine tune this. Um, and it's quite possible that by the early part of 23, we will have an FDA approval for that form of treatment. It's far more complex than something in a vial or even an antibody. Um, and yes, indeed, it is personalized to the patient, but not to the extent that something like neoantigen-based vaccines are. It's still pretty generic. They do have to have uh, what they call release criteria, making sure that the vial or the bag isn't infected with bacteria, making sure that the number of cells is, is within the range that have been associated with the benefit and so on and so forth. But I believe that that's gonna be the next new advance. And if it looks good in patients who've had some kind of treatment and then relapsed, it may turn out to look even better as the first form of therapy sometime down the road. So we'll see. I always say, you know, the rising tide me, um, raises all the boats. And the fact is that as the till cell therapy gets better and more developed, so do the other forms of therapy. And so you don't necessarily, uh, you know, it's not necessarily true that the tills are gonna always stay ahead. It may turn out that the other therapies that are also being developed and that are cheaper and easier and less complex will turn out to, to be ahead in the end. So stay tuned and hopefully we'll keep having these, these conferences and you guys will keep coming or we'll do them all virtual and then we won't have to rent these exorbitant hotel rooms. But thank you. Thank you for coming, those who came. Thank you for listening and watching those who, who did it in the comfort of their homes in other towns and cities. And um, thank you, especially to the speakers who came from near and far. Anybody have any last second questions before we all depart or any comments? Great. Anyway, as Dr. Margolin said, thank you for lasting through the morning. And we appreciate everybody's uh, interest. And certainly, I think if there's questions that weren't answered, they can be sent to us and we'll respond. So if you send us something, we'll email you back. Again, thank you so much.